Hey folks, Dan here. Today on the MicroArch Club podcast, I am joined by Matt Gottbolt. Matt is well known for creating and maintaining the popular Compiler Explorer tool, a web-based interface for examining the output of compilers for many different programming languages. However, in this episode, we spend most of our time going back to Matt's roots. We start off by going in-depth on early microprocessors, namely the Zilog Z80 and MOS Technology 6502, including a discussion of undocumented opcodes and their creative uses. We then talk about Matt's time in the gaming industry and what went into building games for early consoles before discussing his experience working on YouTube for cell phones at Google. The last part of our conversation focuses primarily on the past 15 years of Matt's career, which has been in financial trading. Matt explains why trading requires a deep understanding of hardware and software and shares how technology such as FPGAs allow firms to gain a competitive advantage. A common theme throughout our conversation is the ever-rising complexity of processors and the systems built on top of them. While abstraction of hardware and low-level software has allowed us to build new applications faster than ever before, Matt and I both assert that there is value in understanding what is going on behind the scenes. Or, as Matt states succinctly in our conversation, you should always understand the abstraction level directly above and directly beneath you, and there is always at least one level beneath you. I followed Matt's work for quite some time, but I wanted to extend a thank you to Jonathan Yu for suggesting that I ask Matt to join for an episode of the MicroArch Club. With that, let's get into the conversation. All right. Hey, Matt, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Absolutely. I've uh, followed uh, some of your, your work and uh, I might say tooling uh, for, <laughs> for a period of time. Um, and I think, you know, when we were, were chatting about before the show, I think we may have uh, crossed paths on social media or, or GitHub at, at some point so. in time. Yeah. I think so. I literally just before the show, when I was searching uh, for your name to find the the outline you'd sent me, I found some GitHub repos we'd obviously both been looking at at the same time where you'd committed to. So, like, I think we've been broadly following in the same footsteps for a long while. Absolutely, and I will say, I think that you are the first um, listener requested guest um, because Jonathan, you on uh, Mastodon. Uh, kind of uh, pinged you and I think John Masters as well uh, and said y'all would be great candidates and I said that sounds like a great idea so I- I'm super glad to have you here. I'm I'm very pleased he did although I feel slightly fraudulent looking at the uh, folks that have already been on the podcast and also you know the sort of general belief behind the podcast of like discovering things I'm like I'm also on the same journey I think you are to discover how this world got put together that we're so enamored of. Right. Absolutely. Well, you know, I think that one of the common themes with at least all the guests I've had um, so far, which some of them have been released and I've got um, a few that I've recorded that I haven't released yet, is just kind of an interest in uh, computing history. Um, and so in, in some ways, right, we're all like on this journey of understanding about how the industry is evolving and all the things that have, have come before. And one of the things that's really neat, I think, is looking back at computing history and seeing that what's new is kind of old, uh, <laughs> right. old and we're There's really just getting back. It's all been done before. We exactly. go around in circles. Yeah, yeah, quite. Exactly. And so maybe maybe that's kind of a good uh, place for us to get started, just kind of talking about your introduction to computing and, and maybe when you were growing up, uh, how you first uh, were exposed to computers and, and what that environment was like. Absolutely. I have... Uh, I had, there's a sort of family story about the first time I ever saw a computer. I was at a friend's house, and he had a Sinclair Spectrum. Uh, I think I was seven. I must have been seven at the time, so I'm going to age myself here. This was 1983. <laughs> and uh, apparently there was like a, the, one of the really, really simple flight simulators where it was literally a line where the horizon was and, and then four lines for where the runway was. And then the, most of the screen was the instrument panel because that didn't change very often. And so the poor thing only had to draw the tiny little like window at the top. Um and my parents said I was interested in watching this at my friend's house, but then he apparently reset the machine, and which was in that those days you pull the power cable out and plug it back <laughs> in again, right? And then of course it drops into basic, and he started typing in a simple program, and or 
the num- numbers were scrolling up the screen, so as my mum tells me, and apparently I was wrapped with that. That was so interesting to me. I don't really remember this, but <laughs> that was the story. And then as a result of that, on my eighth birthday, I was very lucky to get my own Spectrum. And that's where my journey started, uh, typing in the programs from the book that came with the computer back when, you know, manuals were actually pretty full and had like the data sheet in the back and had the circuit diagram of it even. And, um, you know, there were like the two or three programs that would print out a British Union Jack flag. Uh, and I remember you know, Christmas time, my mum reading it out and me typing it in. And, and you know, that was where the journey began. Um so the the Spectrum was like uh, probably the most, I mean, so it was the Timex, the Sinclair Timex over here in, I say over here, I'm in the States now, despite my accent. Um, <laughs> uh, this, it was the Sinclair Timex over here. So it was a Z80 or Z80, depending on where you come from, uh, processor. And uh, it was it was kind of relatively cheap for, for the time. It, it was a very compact com- computer and it had a very terrible rubber keyboard, which felt awful and, and was pretty <laughs> nasty. But it was a gateway into a whole new world. And of course, what 10-year-old or whatever, by the time I was sort of got to grips with it, didn't want to play computer games. And so we would, you know, back in the day, this would, the games would come on audio cassettes um, they would be encoded. So, you know, if you think of modem screech, but lower and more rubbish, that's the kind of sound that we were, we grew up with. And even now I get the hairs on my back of my neck go up when I hear that noise because it reminds me of those days back when. Right. And so you'd load up games and whatever. And, you know, they were reasonably easy to duplicate legally or otherwise. And so there was quite a circuit around the playground of folks sharing. But eventually you reach the point where you couldn't get more games. And then you're like, well, maybe I could make my own game. Maybe that would be more fun. And so you learn basic, you know, you probably already had learned basic just because of the way that, you know, you turn the computer on, you have to type in commands to even get it to load from the cassette tape. Right. But very quickly you realize, especially with the Spectrum, its implementation of basic was, pun intended, rather basic. And it wasn't very fast. It was incredibly slow. It was not a fast in- interpreter. And so any game that was more than like the number guessing game where you say, is it higher than seven? Yes. Or is your number seven, you know, eight, whatever. Um, anything more than that was a little bit too much for it. So I remember I wrote a couple of strategy games and I wrote a little adventure game. And I even got as far as selling one of these games in the back of a you know magazine where you could like the classified ads at the back, you know, write, send 10 pounds to this address and we'll send you a cassette in the post. I sold one copy, <laughs> not, <laughs> not very much, but it was better than nothing, right? Right. Um, but then you get to the point where you're like, well, I really want a game where I can shoot things because, you know, that's more exciting than typing stuff in. And at that point, the only way to get any kind of performance is to write this thing called assembly. And you didn't really understand what it was, but you knew you had to to, to do it to get the performance. It was the thing that, you know, you knew that, that stuff was written either in assembly or basic. Right. Um, the Spectrum didn't have an assembler, which was a which was a shame. You know, you had to go and buy one, and I couldn't afford one. Mm-hmm. And so, um, I remember the very first assembly program I ever got working uh, was a scroll text, very simple scroll text at the bottom of a screen, and it was written during a very boring swimming gala that I had to attend because my sister was was in, and I hand assembled it on the back of the the program for the the you know the the schedule for the for the gala the swimming gala oh, right, right and then i got yeah, the I program is, is an incredibly overloaded word in this context right, right? right. <laughs> i was gonna ask did you bring the the spectrum with you to this event? no it was would have been... written in pencil right. on the back and then hand assembled when i got home and it worked first time and i was really hooked then that one then i managed to find mm. someone who had an assembler and i wrote um a sort of simple block-based game where you ran around but it was a lot faster than you could ever achieve with basic and there were like a little tiny bit of programmable logic in it and it was it was it was the the door was open but you know i consider it an absolute blessing that i was born when i was and computers were as simple air quotes simple right as they were back then because a 10 year old 12 year old could fit the whole thing reasonably in their head and understand enough of it, especially with the right amount of will <laughs> and, and motivation to make a game, to 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 uh, yeah understand the whole thing and make a, a game themselves. Uh, nowadays, mm-hmm. of course, you know my, I've got kids that are older than that now, and the pair of them are like, well, I want to make Minecraft and I want to make you know 
uh, some new FPS. I'm like, well, that's a long way away from like a, a one block, mo- a star moving around inside a, a, a maze of of, astro- uh, of pluses and minuses. But right. but um, yeah. So um, then I moved from from the uh, the ZX Spectrum. Uh, a very good friend of mine had a BBC. Um, so the, back in the eighties, the British government decided that in order to kind of get ahead. They should teach their all their citizens about this newfangled thing called a microcomputer, mm-hmm. and they commissioned a, uh, the BBC to make a program, a TV program now, and in U- UK English that's program MME at the end, <laughs> which is a <laughs> strange thing. But yeah, you can't hear that on a podcast. Anyway, a, a program which would then be distributed, you know, broadcast. That's what we call it back, isn't it? Distributed. To, um, broadcast to everyone to teach them what a computer was and the makers of this 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 tv show there we are we'll go with a slightly less ambiguous right. word name here <laughs> decided that they should have an official computer to go alongside of it so that they could teach the the ideas that they were doing with a, an actual physical computer that you could also get yourself and obviously there were other ones around but they wanted to make it sort of mostly affordable and it, critically it was going to go into schools at the time so that schools would have this sort of backup as well and so like the whole there was a generation my age that grew up with a particular computer in their school and that computer was made by a company called Acorn who very famously at the last minute sort of outbid and outmaneuvered uh, Sir Clive Sinclair of the ZX Spectrum mm. or Timex mm-hmm. Sinclair um and uh got the contract to make this computer even though the computer had been made in like three days with them soldering it together right. and writing the, the software in all nighters and literally as the person from the bbc was due to come in to see this apparent demonstration machine it wasn't working and for the whole time someone was having to hold like a wire that they discovered was loose with their hand or you know like <laughs> otherwise earthed it or grounded in some way you know one of those amazing stories it's probably right. more apocryphal than real but it's great to think about um but um they won the contract and this machine was um you know pretty prevalent in the uk and that was the computer i moved to actually i moved to the sort of 128 kilobyte version of it which you know woohoo, a whole 128k um and um that had a 6502 mm-hmm. in it which was the movement of you know different uh cpu from the z80 obviously and right. sort of curiously was like really a risk processor if the z80 Mm -hmm. is a cisc processor you know like there's 768 odd opcodes that that it has uh the 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 6502 has less than 256 not every single opcode in the one byte that is an opcode actually encodes for something that they they meant to happen right which is a whole other story we can get into in a minute uh and so that was what i really focused on so during my my teen late teens i was i was working with a good friend of mine and we were making games and we were sending there was a, a magazine uh back when that was a thing uh perhaps <laughs> you, some folks will remember what magazines were you know they're they like thin flimsy books that you could buy once a month from a from a special shop that sold it's, them <laughs> it's like if you you know printed a pdf or something like that you know that's right yeah or like a blog post or something like that a secret sequence of blog right. posts are all printed out yeah but um there were there was an appetite for uh, type in programs where you would buy the magazine and at the back of the magazine in like a yellow pages and really cheap quality print there was you know 800 line programs for various different things and there'd be articles in a magazine explaining why you could why you might want might you want why you might want to type the program in with little screenshots and things and like and, and lots of artist drawings that made it look a lot more impressive than it actually was but it was we were hooked right that was that was a way that you could learn more about how to program the computer Be, they, essentially they were like the blog po- blog posts and the, or, or right. the the stack overflow of their days you know you would type it in and inevitably you type it in wrong and it wouldn't work <laughs> and then you'd scratch your head and you'd stare at the thing and you kind of go well I think I understand enough of the flow of it to now work out where I must have typed it in wrong. And so you learned right. debugging skills before you even knew what debugging was. And that was great. And yeah, later in my teens, I was I was writing articles with my friend and sending them to this. Mm-hmm. And it was a great way of, of uh, you know, keeping us in a few 10 pounds here, 20 pounds there for, for, for buying more games as it happened, right? You know, that, that was... Uh, but it meant that we... Start, again, the, the chips were simple enough, the computer was simple enough... And the BBC had a built-in assembler just mm. out of the gate. You turn the computer on, you open a square bracket, and you're typing assembly. It was fantastic. Uh, and, but the the BASIC was also incredibly fast. It was a very good put-together version of BASIC. Um, 
the the person who wrote that basic went on to write the basic for uh the archimedes which we'll probably talk about well maybe we'll talk about in a second um i know some foreshadowing here i'm getting all excited right. as well because this is <laughs> such a great story, set of stories uh but yeah so it was it was wonderful that we were able to learn so much about this this system and it was so uh, everyone had the same system under their desk, not like PCs these days where everything's different. So if you found some clever trick about your computer, it would work on everyone else's computer too, even if it wasn't in the manual. Right. And so people, enterprising folks, would realize that of those 256 opcodes in the 6502, some were not specified. But like somewhere there's tra- there's a network of transistors doing something. And it's not like they right. threw an exception, a hardware level exception. It's just like, no, different parts of the chip turned on because this these bits were high and these bits were low. And so very famously, um, there was like a store instruction. Store A was one opcode. Store X, the X register, was the next opcode. Store Y was the next opcode. And then doesn't do anything, undefined, was the next one. You're like, well, is there a fourth secret register or what? Right. <laughs> And so you try it out, and through a bit of working out, you, you realize that, no, what it's doing is there's a those two bits that are the bottom two bits of the opcode are selecting either, if the both are clear, then it's the accumulator that's put onto some internal bus inside mm-hmm. the 6502. And then if the low bit is set, the X is put onto the bus. And if the high bit is set, the Y bit Y register is put onto the bus. But if you set both of them, it just puts the X register and that this is the, like, as well as and the Y right. register onto the bus. And because it was an NMOS design, we discover later on, that meant that essentially the zero bits would win. Mm-hmm. So it was actually an and. It was X and Y that was put onto the bus, which meant that then when the store circuitry went to go and now push this out to memory, you got the X register anded with the right Y register written out to memory. And maybe that's useful to you if you're writing a sprite routine. Right. And for example, you need to mask the bits that you don't want to change with... A, a sort of like don't change these bits uh mask so you know these were clever things that people would discover and determine and um and even like the video circuitry was clever you could do some tricks to change and lie to the the, the, the system that it had slightly more lines or slightly fewer lines and cause it to generate the h sync or the v sync at different times which would be interpreted then, interpreted then by the monitor or more likely the television that it was plugged into as mm moving up and down slightly so you could get it to wiggle around and then with careful other things timed you could get the screen to scroll around in a very smooth way that was otherwise totally impossible for something that underpowered right so there were a lot of really cool things that you would learn back then about how to take make the most of it but um by the yeah. end of this pro yeah go sorry you <laughs> no i was just gonna uh jump in while, while we're kind of like on the 6502 so you mentioned uh two very important 8-bit microprocessors, right? The Z80 and the 6502. Um, and there's kind of a, a couple of other contemporaries around there. But in some of the, the you know, some of my own experience and some of the research I was doing for this show, um, you know, the the BBC Micro, um, and then I believe uh, from from my uh, pre-show stalking that we, we talked about uh, before we jumped on here, uh, you had a BBC Master, is that right? That's correct, yes. That was the okay. posh 128K right. version, yeah. Right. And so the, um, I, you know, I've, I've heard in, in talking with a lot of folks, um, that these computers are really impactful. And also the 6502 was in uh, a number of other very notable systems. So that the Apple one, Apple two, um, the NES, um, I'm, I'm leaving off a number of here. I don't, I don't know if you have any off the top of your head that, that I haven't named, but, uh, um, uh, Bender from Futurama has a okay. 6502 and yeah. the Terminator. Okay. If you, if you freeze frame the Terminator when he's got the stuff scrolling down the screen at the very beginning of the movie, it's 6502 opcodes, and it's like a bootloader, boot ROM thing. It's copying memory down low. <laughs> right. Okay. Perfect. So, so both, uh, both real and fictional, uh, <laughs> impactful computers. Exactly. Um, but yeah, so, so you mentioned um, kind of the uh, that it was somewhat of a, a reduced instruction set computer, um, and that there was a, a space of 256 opcodes. Um, I think there was uh, 151 used for 56 instructions, um, which uh, you know is is drastically smaller than some of the the contemporaries, which I think was a uh, contributor to it being cheap, which I think was like the the big driver of you know the systems that it was put into a, being able to be cheap, and then also is probably why when I talked to so many folks that they had exposure to it, right? Because it was more accessible and kind of like drove this 
revolution, you know, of having personal computers and that sort of thing. I was, I was curious, you know, um, in moving from the, uh, the spectrum to the BBC master, was there a significant price difference between those two machines? Cause I know the Z80 was also on the cheaper side, but, but more expensive than the 65. So the, the BBC was actually very expensive for what it was. Okay. The, the 6502 may have been cheap, but they, um, I think the the expensive part was the RAM. They put in RAM that was, mm. and this is this is the probably one and only time in the history of the universe uh, that this has been true. The RAM was <laughs> twice as fast as the CPU, mm. which meant that the the CPU and the video circuitry shared it on alternating cycles. So it was running at four megahertz, and the TV output system was running at two megahertz. As was the um, the the CPU, and then they were out of phase by. Uh, you know half a clock or however that works and so that meant that you never had contended ram which we had got on the z80 there were banks of ram which were slower to access because that's also where the screen was and so Mm. you were sharing it with the screen every time the tv needed to serialize out more colors the spectrum would the ula and the spectrum would grab the bus essentially steal it away from the cpu and go no this is mine now um take the the information it needed and then the cpu would run slower whereas on the um on the, the, the BBC, uh, it was just shared time sliced style, which ah, is pretty bonkers to even think about, right? The, the, the RAM is twice as fast as the CPU. What would we, what would we give for, for that these right. days, right? <laughs> right, right. We definitely have the opposite uh, situation now. The, right. um, uh, and, and one of the other things that I um, kind of observed about the 6502, that it was, despite it, um, you know, having less functionality, if you will, or seemingly less functionality, um, it was much more performant in a lot of cases um, than some of the competitors. And, um, you know, I think there was a a variety of reasons for that. You mentioned that um, there was only a a handful of registers. I think you mentioned the accumulator, the um, X and Y registers, and I think there was a stack pointer and a program counter. Um, That's right, although those weren't really registers in the same sense, just like they aren't on most architectures. Right. Uh, The, yeah, it was... The, the Z80, on the other hand, had all of these sort of paired 16-bit registers, sort of pseudo 16-bit registers that sort of very presaged the 8080 that it was sort of around contemporaneously. And there was a lot of cross-pollination and some strange IP-related nonsense that then sort of bled. So there's a little bit of x86 smell to it, right, mm-hmm. um, even back then. Um, but the, the the Spectrum was really, oh, sorry, the Z80 was very interesting because to save money in the Z80, they only had a 4-bit ALU that they just pumped twice to get 8-bit answers or four times to get the 16-bit answers, which meant that even like really simple things, although it was clocked at a higher speed, at least it was in the Spectrum, I think 3.57. Someone's going to correct me in the comments, I'm sure. <laughs> um, but somewhere of that range, it took more cycles to do anything. And there were like mm. very complicated P states and T states and other things that were to do with like, am I accessing RAM or not accessing RAM? The 6502, on the other hand, access RAM every single cycle unconditionally. There was no even memory um, enable pin on it. It was like, nope, if if the clock's happening, I'm looking at RAM or I'm reading from RAM or I'm writing to RAM. That's the only two, th- you know, that's the two things I'm doing. Right. Which, uh, which, you know, reduced the pin count on the actual chip itself, simplified the design of everything. You just plugged it into RAM and went, there you go. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's... Um, and it meant that, you know, instructions like load the accumulator were one cycle to read the byte to load the accumulator, one cycle to store the value, to read the value from the 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 the, the, op, the op code and mm-hmm. put it into the accumulator. And I think there was another one cycle there always because I think took took three. Is that right? Oh, no, now I'm doubting myself. This is awful. I've got a huge <laughs> table at them somewhere. But, you know, it was pretty straightforward, although I've just demonstrated it's a bit more complicated. Right. But, um, because it was just... It was how many memory accesses did you need to do the work? Um, mm. And that was it. Whereas the Z80 had this, like, I, I may take four cycles to do a mul- uh, an add even uh, because there's, you know, four four bit things to do. Um, but that led to some really interesting side effects, actually, on the 6502 now we're here that were kind of kind of unobservable when, okay. as a programmer. Mm-hmm. And yet. <laughs> <laughs> so um, one of the um, one of the opcodes is a rotate instruction. So it reads a value and rotates it, as in shifts it up one and takes the top bit and puts it back down where the bottom bit was, and then it writes it back. So this is a read, modify, write instruction. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first op- the first cycle would be read the role 
opcode. The next two cycles would be read the address that I'm going to be doing this from. The fourth cycle would be read from that address. Now I know where it is. The fifth cycle, well, I'm doing the rotate, dot, dot, dot. And the sixth <laughs> cycle is, oh, and I'm writing it back. Mm -hmm. But as I've said, there is no memory enable disable pin. So what's it doing on that fifth cycle? It's accessing something. It's doing something with the RAM. So what is it doing? Um, and the only and again, it wouldn't matter, right? As long as it's not de destroying anything, presumably whatever it's going to do is it's going to write the correct piece of information at the end. But mm -hmm. it could reasonably just read the same value twice, maybe. Maybe it you know, could write to some dummy location or it could read some dummy location or whatever. But it turns out it actually writes back the unmodified value, effectively, the little oh. table in the ALU, not in the ALU, in the, uh, uh, what do they call it? The, not the ULA. There's like a uh, like little little array of, like, it's not quite microcode. It's just like on step three of instruction five, then... Oh, the, the PLA? And the... PLA, thank you. Yep. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, thank you. I knew that it was, it's one of those <laughs> three-letter acronyms that I right, can't right. remember. <laughs> but... On that fifth cycle, they just said, well, we might as well start the write operation, even though it doesn't do anything, because we're going to write something. And then on the sixth cycle, we're going to write the correct value anyway. So on the fifth cycle, it redundantly wrote the value it just read. And then the sixth cycle, it wrote the, the, the correct value. And you think, again, totally unobservable. Why would you care? Except lots of hardware was memory mapped in those days, mm. as it is now, in fact, right? But that meant that reading and writing to memory sometimes had a side effect. Right. And so... Nobody would choose to do this, really. But if you are, for example, making a game and you want to make sure no one can copy your game or no one can at least, you know, hack it to put extra lives or cheats or whatever into it, what you might reasonably do is encrypt your game and then um, write the decryption routine and have the decryption routine, like decrypt the code that's immediately after it and then, it, and then run into it. Like as in, as in the last instruction of the decryption routine, the next thing after that is the first byte of the thing it decoded. Right. There's no breakpoints on these machines. There's nothing like that. Um, there are like registers you can set that say, if we get interrupted, reset the machine and wipe RAM. So like I could once it's got to that point, it's this a it's a like a, a one way street. The only thing I can do is reset the computer after that. But I can play the game, right? But it means right. I can't get into it and look at it and hack it or anything like that. Um, but obviously, if you can see the instructions that do the decoding, because you can load it off the disk yourself, you can just do yourself what those instructions did, either by copying them somewhere else and running them and then and then running the decoding and then maybe saving it before you run to the, the, the decrypted game. And now you've got a decrypted version of the game. And so there was a cat and mouse game in yeah. the early 90s about this kind of stuff. And um, the sort of... the. The, the cat and mouse game increased from just simple exclusive or with some random keys that I made up through to, well, what if we, as, as the encryption writer, what if we use random bytes we read off the disk in places that you wouldn't expect? Okay, fair enough. That stops you from copying the disk. Uh, what if we start doing things like, there are these hardware timers. I can read from a hardware timer. Mm. The value is always changing. Now, if we copy the code down, if me as a hacker copies the code down low and tries to do this, the time is changing. And because I'm manipulating it myself externally, time is changing more differently than if it was running free. So now the key, right. the decryption key, isn't the same. And so I don't decode the game. But there are ways and means of stopping the timers and then rewinding them back exactly the right amount and then carrying on and stopping them again and rewinding them and all this kind of nonsense. And then so eventually uh, somebody came up with a protection system where they threw the kitchen sink of everything they could possibly think of that was like essentially either not that was deterministic but unspecified mm. one of the things was things like rotating some of these timers if you rotate the timer then obviously reading and writing to a timer has a side effect of, of setting and resetting it and this role was one of the many things that there was done that would cause this weird behavior that no one would have known and in fact many years later we tracked down the person who wrote this protection system and said how did you know all this stuff Right. Because, you know, all these things fed into the key and, you know, things like enabling interrupts and then having these timers make the interrupts go off and then the interrupt deliberately corrupting registers so the decryption routine would actually return in a specified place with a different mm -hmm. accumulator value than when it's you know, like, who would do such a thing? And we're like, well, how did you know what it was going to do? And he said, I, I didn't. I just knew it was <laughs> deterministic. And we're like, but, but then how did you encrypt this? How did you have this depth of knowledge and whatever? He said, well... I desoldered the chips off of the board. I disabled the functionality that wipes the memory when it breaks. 
you know when when it gets when it when it um right. uh when it hits the end and through some clever tricks which i won't go into now as we've already been talking about this for 10 minutes but um he found a series of um decryption or rather sort of um uh, yeah i suppose it is decryption things which formed a ring of cycle 255 mm. and so mm. he painstakingly did this 255 times and then saved the penultimate one and that was the one that went to the fabrication factory and he still doesn't understand how it was now the, <laughs> i shall tell you now why i know this which perhaps will segue in or we can go back and this is because many years later well first of all i tried to hack that game as a kid and i failed and it was a uh, my friend uh, Richard and I wrote uh, a 6502 simulator in 6502 <laughs> to try and <laughs> simulate it perfectly in order to decode the stupid thing, and we failed. But fast forward 20 years, and I wanted to write an emulator for my BBC, my beloved BBC Micro, and mm-hmm. in order to just run the game, not try to decrypt it, just to run it normally, I had to solve all of those problems and really understand at the lowest level what's going on so i can tell you that the fifth cycle of a roll writes the uninitialized value back and i and i know why because i simulate it in the emulator in order to have this work and in fact uh, the the protection system is now one of the unit tests of my uh, <laughs> of my uh, of my emulators like does it decode yes good right where you go Right. So anyway, that was a huge derailment. Um, no, that, <laughs> that was great. Uh, I, I've looked through your, your emulator a little bit and actually was uh, poking at some of, of your unit tests because um, I was curious about um, one of the, the other attributes of the 6502, um, which is, is documented behavior, um, it turns out. Um, and that is the uh, zero page addressing mode, which I thought was, right. I don't know if this is, was common at that time, um, but it was I, I don't uh, think it was. an interesting thing. Yeah. I think it's, it was basically, it was the, 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 the only way for it to have pointers, because we, as we've discussed, we had an A register, an X register, and a Y register, and those were all mm-hmm. eight bit registers, unlike the Z80 with its paired HL, D, E, B, C, A, F registers. Mm-hmm. Um, the 6502 didn't have 16 um, bit registers. But you could indirect through a pair of memory locations in the zero page, as you say. So the first 256 bytes of RAM was just still normal RAM. It wasn't cache. It wasn't special. It was still out in the, on, on the board. But the opcodes that accessed it could, uh, first of all, they only needed one byte. If the opcode said, hey, I'm a zero page opcode, then there was only one byte for the address. And the second, there were several indirect instructions that would r- operate through a pair of zero page addresses uh, and treat it as a 16-bit address to then read from somewhere else so it's almost like you had 128 16-bit registers available mm-hmm. to you which was really quite a powerful concept and 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 some of the more exotic architectures these days that have like belt computers or like register files that spill there's a sort of flavor of that there isn't any way of like offsetting the zero page you could use the x register to actually offset into the zero page but that was very uncommon you know it was essentially like you had to very carefully allocate your zero page if you're writing a game and you're like well the operating system such as it is still writes to this in an nmi routine so i have to like leave those ones alone but i can if i page the roms out from the basic and then disable interrupts then i can use four zero through four f or whatever it is you know and somehow you could get some memory in the zero page Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, I think it was a really interesting and innovative way. And, again, it's very simplistic, right? It's not traditionally risky because it's not like load store. Right. I mean, like, you know, there were instructions that would do these read, modify, writes and things like that. But it was a really simple set of very straightforward concepts that were used to build all of the rest of the instructions. And I think that's sort of what I think of as being risky, even though, that yeah, as I say, there's not strictly load store. Right. Yeah, it was interesting. I feel like the I haven't encountered many other instruction sets with the I think there was 13 addressing modes maybe for the 6502. So Sounds about right. Yeah, so <laughs> there'd be, a, there'd be know, a file somewhere in the emulator with them all listed and <laughs> Right. Right. Yeah, there's a you know, they they've shrunk down the number of instructions, but you can execute them all in a, a variety of ways. So Right. Um yeah. And, th- and it wasn't as beautiful as as um some of the later things that were inspired by it in terms of the way it was laid out so you couldn't mix and match them arbitrarily but you could do most things in most ways you know that that was kind of a nice nice thing but yeah yeah absolutely the um the kind of mention of having more right essentially more registers like available um for some reason almost every episode of the podcast thus far 
uh, register windows have come up. Right, that's... Um, <laughs> And, and uh, it's probably so why it's top of mind for me. <laughs> right, right, right. I, I forgot that you had uh, listened to some of them. I will say that um, I can I can give you a preview of the next episode that is going to come Ooh. out, which is very relevant to Register Windows because uh, my interview is with Robert Garner, who designed the Spark Instruction set. Oh, um, cool. So uh, he goes very deep on on Register Windows. Oh, I look forward um, to that then. This yeah, is now... But- Folks listening to this now will be like, well, this is a real window into when things are recorded whenever. Right, right. right. They're, the they're getting is a w- fully open now. <laughs> exactly. Right. They're getting a window into my my need for a, a backlog to, to keep going here. But, um, well, you know, that's that's uh, quite the experience you had, you know, while you were still kind of growing up, uh, being exposed to all these different things. You mentioned um, that it was kind of a blessing uh, to... I, I might say like have to be exposed to computers at that level, right? Because it was there a choice, is... right? But there was there was right. I was receptive, and right. we, but it, but it was there. You know, if you had the need mm-hmm. to to make a game, that was how you were going to do it. Yeah, right. I mean, one of the things that I felt uh, kind of like growing up and you know earlier on in my career and that sort of thing, where I was being introduced to computing at uh, with machines that were much more complex and also uh, tooling that was much higher level and more capable. Um, is that, you know, investing in kind of like learning uh, lower level concepts and that sort of thing could be viewed, I, I, I would push back on this notion, but could be viewed as kind of unproductive, right? Um, not not doing the most productive thing there. Why so would you learn ways, how this right. stuff works when really it should be hidden from you? You know, if you're learning to drive a car, you don't need to understand how an ignition coil works, right? And right. It, but it's kind of, it is useful to know. Somehow? Absolutely. You and know? apparently, you know, there's there's other people like us who think that as well. One of my, my favorite uh, quotes was from uh, Tom Lyon, who uh, has been on a number of different podcasts. He was an early uh, Sun employee. And uh, he, I, th- I always butcher the quote, but it was something like, um, uh, abstractions are meant to create boundaries for machines, not people. So, uh, or people are meant to pierce abstraction layers, even though machines are not. So, um, it's kind of like, yes, we should use abstraction to enable us to do things, uh, faster and, and you know, with more certainty, but that doesn't mean that we are resigned to not look. No, I think that's it. The, yeah. The abstractions are a tool and we can use them to help and they can be used in all sorts of things, you know, like I, they can be used in an organization to say, well, you know, this right. isn't really how that part of the organization works, but what we have to do is fill in this form and then a bit later on a computer arrives and I don't need to know anything about how that that happened but you know that's how i purchase things or whatever or we can use it as like well i type this thing into the computer and then i get linear algebra solutions and that's great um but as long as you can keep going down the levels of abstraction as long as there's no barriers to you um you know i think you should always be aware of the 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 lower the layer below you and Mm -hmm. a couple of layers above you if if such a thing exists you know and there's and it doesn't matter how low you are there's always at least one layer below you right right? Right, (laughs) as i've learned as as i'm sure you're learning in this journey too you know you think things you take as red and then you're like oh wait someone had to oh yeah that doesn't work the way i thought at all i just assumed that worked like ram it just works right you're like no (laughs) there's a whole (laughs) set of things to think about how does that work right Right. Absolutely. Well, okay. So moving, um, after, you know, maybe like going through high school, I imagine, um, was, uh, some of that storyline there. And then, uh, you eventually, um, go to university. What's kind of your, like most folks, when they're going to university, they're thinking, Hmm, what do I want to, you know, do and learn about and that sort of thing. What was kind of your motivation at that time? Obviously, uh, lots of exposure to computing, but right. did you see that as a career path? No, that was it. I think <laughs> it would never ever cross my mind. Mm-hmm. That's not true. I think it probably did cross my mind. But I had always been interested in physics and science in general. And I sort of designed my a route in my head that was like, I'm going to go to university. I'm going to get a master's in physics and I'm going to do my PhD. And then I'm going to do quantum physics or astrophysics or something like that. Um, and this computing thing was just my almost life-defining hobby right even then and i never really thought about it as anything more than that um my my journey for physics started from so this is a strange non-secretary story but like in the uk in the uh, 80s i used to wake up really really early and there would be nothing on the television the tv shows tv stations would shut down there were only four of them or probably three or two of them at the time even then um 
but over the, and so overnight it was just a test picture of like you know beep with the little like nothing right. here um but there was one channel where a distance learning university used to transmit its lectures that you would set your VCR for at like 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. and you would record an hour-long lecture. And I used to wake up and watch this because it was the only thing that was on. <laughs> and I have these vivid memories of these bearded 70s men dropping marbles into like bowls and then through land of extremely primitive camera technology showing superimposing all of the various frames to show the pattern that the marble was rolling in and then writing out equations on boards about it. And I was like, again... I think a common theme here is like weird sigils on a screen gets me right. interested. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so that was started my interest in physics. And then, yeah, I went to university. I studied physics and I it studied. I'm going to have to do air quotes here that, that your listeners will not see. Uh, because really, as soon as I've discovered the Internet, such as it was back then, and computers where they were more, they were bigger and more powerful than I was used to. So by this time, I'd graduated on from the BBC Master. So like, I think I was 17. So it was like last or penultimate year of, of uh, high school that I got an Archimedes, mm. which was made by Acorn, who were the same company that made the BBC Micro. It was a natural progression from that. But they had decided to jump this 8-bit era all the way to 32-bit and forget this 16-bit era. So like all my contemporaries. So I hung on to the Beeb three years past its best before date, right? It was way overdue. Everyone else was already on their Ataris and their Amigas and learning about Blitter chips and things that were really cool and interesting. But I was like, no, I can do this on my 8-bit machine. It's fine. <laughs> and then eventually when I gave in, I was like, well, I'm going to go with Acorn still. And by this point, Acorn had designed their own 32-bit microprocessor. Mm -hmm. And this microprocessor uh, was inspired heavily by the 6502 that they'd cut their teeth on. The team had knew all about it. They went out to uh, Western Digital, or whoever uh, was the designer at the time of the 6502, and said, can you tell us about how you make a chip? And it, it turns out it's like three people, in uh, by this point, three people in like a bungalow in Texas going like, sure, this is how we made it. Like, what? <laughs> you, right. this is, so it's possible for like mortal humans, like a small number of them, to design a chip and they're like, yeah, of course it is. I, I, I think, you know, the original 6502, Bill Mensch and all that kind of stuff was, you know, bearded men again, unfortunately, as, as is the way in our industry at the moment, although we're trying to change that, right? Um, right. With Sharpies on a big acetate sheet drawing out the 6502. But it was, you know, the, the, the later versions of it were done uh, similarly. And so anyway, the folks from Acorn came away and said, well, we can do this too. How hard can it be? Nobody told them how hard it was to make a chip, so... They, you know, they were like, we can do this. And they right. designed this really beautiful 32-bit machine. And they'd learned from the 6502 where it's like this almost nice separation of addressing modes and flag setting and all this thing. And they thought, well, if I've got 32-bit fixed size opcos, I can fit them in nice places. And so it's really kind of a nicely designed system. And that they called it the Acorn Risk machine because it was very much a load store architecture with 15 registers or 16 if you include the program counter and of course we all know i'm doing the whole long reveal for you here as you're smiling at me knowing what i'm talking about here as more almost all of your listeners but this was the arm chip the very first arm chip and so the very first 32-bit machine i ever got my hands on was an arm and just like the acorn before it uh sorry the bbc before it straight into assembly because it was the same basic you could open squiggly braces and start typing uh, uh, six, uh, uh, 65 two arm assembly and it was you know it was beautiful it was so uh simplistic uh it was super fast for the the clock speed i think mine was like an eight megahertz or 12 megahertz and mm. you know and so and the multiple load and store instructions that it had which was a lovely lovely way of like reading and writing multiple registers from like a ascending or descending memory location which was perfect for pushing and popping going in and out of functions but also it was amazing because you could point it at the screen and blitz sprites as fast as you could so although it didn't <laughs> have sprite hardware to write games you could do pretty well with these with clever use of these multiple load and store instructions you know read from here put the over here um and so i had learned arm assembly and i'd thrown everything out the wall and so i was writing everything still in arm assembly and so i got to university that's where we were with before we started this <laughs> <clears throat> i discovered the internet and the internet was amazing and uh one of the first things i did was write an internet relay cl uh, chat client for my acorn because they were still niche even in the uk you know nobody had them Right. Um, and so if you wanted to join an IRC, you either went to the, the, the lab and you used IRC, or, like the command line client in Unix, or if you had 
as a client on your 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 local machine and you had like a serial cable to connect to the network then you could you know actually uh do it from a gui uh, i decided to write my own and because i only knew assembly i wrote the whole thing in arm assembly and it's i don't know how many thousands and thousands of lines I've, it's on github if you want to go and laugh at it all but it was well, a full... uh, we'll link in the show notes for sure yeah, we... <laughs> <laughs> if people want to torture themselves but yeah. <laughs> it was a fascinating experience of, of learning so while i was supposedly doing my physics degree i was writing this irc client um the irc client ended up because all irc clients at the time had like scripting languages built in them so you could like do auto greeters and things like that i ended up writing a scripting language in it which looks remarkably like bbc basic except it was object orientated and then i was doing managed memory and so i invented this way of cleaning up the memory after you'd finished with it without having to free it manually which i later discovered is mark sweep garbage collection <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and i'm like oh right I, and at, at some point along this path it should have dawned on me that if i could should ask my roommates who were like doing an actual computer science degree what the <laughs> heck it was i was really building um but towards the end of this it became obvious that it was absurd to be writing large gui applications in pure assembly and so begrudgingly and and because i wanted to have my programs run on um the computers at the university lab i learned c and i you know but c back then was this kind of c that I mean, the compilers weren't sophisticated enough the kind of thing where you could see pun intended again <laughs> what assembly was going to come out the other side you know int right. x equals zero. Oh, i know that's going to be an ldr zero com, you know r zero comma no or, or whatever mov sorry See, I've forgotten all these opcodes now. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, this is a setup for where I ended up with, you know, seeing the way that the compiler takes your code and puts it out into uh, uh, right. into the output. But uh, yeah, so that was, that was how I learned um, C. Um, and but what, where, yeah, where did ahead. you get your compiler uh, from at that time? So for uh, at uh, university, it was GCC. Okay. Or mm -hmm. the the CC that was on the Spark Station, the Irix workstation, or whatever it was, I could get a hold of. Around this time as well, we inherited between me and my roommates, we in inherited a multi-user dungeon source code, which was kind of how I learned C. Really, was was having to hack on it and extend it and add new stuff to it. Um, so that was that was fun. Um, and um, yeah, so it, that would compile on whatever machine we could s steal time on to run our mud and have other people connect to, which obviously was not very many people. Didn't they didn't like the idea of us running long lived services? So, right, um, yeah, you could imagine. Um, and oh, I've just lost my train of thought. Sorry, <laughs> where well, we got I, you? What what came after? So so you're you're kind of uh, uh, you know learning C. You're experimenting with uh, various machines and uh, you know running some of these services and that sort of thing. At that point, did you start to think, okay, maybe maybe I'm spending a lot of time on this. Maybe this could be more related to my profession as well. I don't know that I did explicitly. You know, I was I was I I was scraping by in my degree. I got like a mid tier degree, a two two in the uh, by the end of it all. And in the last few weeks, I started looking for a job somewhat half heartedly. And then somebody on IRC in the hash Acorn channel said, well, you could try applying to to my company we make computer games hmm. and i'm like well i've always made computer games i've got them around you know and like this mud is kind of a computer game it's a different kind of computer game but you know i've still got my eye in as it were so i messaged him and he said gave me the details i applied and um that was my route into the games industry which was my basically my career for a decade uh, it was based on a, a random conversation with a, of an internet stranger on an IRC channel using my own handwritten IRC client from a computer right. like, that nobody knew about. <laughs> right. And and so was uh, did you start working there pretty much immediately? And also, uh, was this like, was there, it seems like I'm not super familiar with what the culture was like um, at that time. Obviously, computing, you know, was a uh, a big part of the university. And, you know, you, you mentioned the, the government kind of like commissioning computers, right? So it wasn't like this was a, uh, you know, an unheard of thing. But was right. there any sort of notion of like, you, you were going to get a PhD, right? Now you're going to go work on not, games or was it pretty much? Not seamless? really. I mean, I mean, it probably took 15 years for my mum to stop asking me when I was going to get a proper job. Right. So, you know, from her point of view, I never had a proper job, but then it was a games job anyway. So, I mean, you, I probably could have walked into some mortgage company writing admin systems or whatever, and that would have been seen as like a 
real good real job yeah. but but um no it was so yeah i i got the job actually it was the the end of the penultimate year i i know that's um yeah i don't know how common that is over here but like you know there's not kind of an internship but i i went for it anyway ahead of time and they said mm-hmm. um we don't need you to have a physics degree you should just quit and come and work for us but yeah <laughs> i thought i would better at least finish my degree and have something uh, to have my name on, which actually turned out to be a very good decision later on when I tried to move to the US and it was very helpful to have a degree in order to help the process there. But that's a whole other story. Right. Um, but no, so I I, I, uh, I actually went to, so the company was called Argonaut Games. It was one of the biggest uh, independent games companies in the UK, in fact, probably in Europe at the time. Uh, it ultimately floated on the stock exchange, so it was a big enough company to go on to mm. the 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 uk stock exchange although that was kind of the beginning of the end unfortunately like so many (laughs) dot com style booms although a lot earlier than that um the argonaut is probably noted because uh it was the sort of silent partner in the super fx chip which powered Star Fox in the super nintendo so if people have ever played Star Fox, you know i came in at the tail end of that that Star Fox had been out and there were some sort of secondary and even tertiary games that were using the super fx chip but uh jez the the ceo um had sort of basically lied to nintendo telling them that he could easily generate you know 3d graphics it can't be that hard kind of thing again so there's kind of a theme here going right you know like how hard can it be he said and then he sort of came back from a meeting with japan um there's a long convoluted story but this is an extremely short version and probably equally inaccurate version um and basically (laughs) said to people um who knows how to make a6 <laughs> and uh, maybe i don't know and so they designed this chip which was essentially a 3d coprocessor well before its time mm-hmm. although insanely convoluted to wedge it into a cartridge as a sort of secondary on a system which wasn't expecting to have a secondary chip other than like ram and ppu and maybe some other sort of addressable stuff so it kind of involved a lot of dancing between the cpu that was running instructions were essentially like read from ram read from ram read from ram write to ram read from ram right you know to, to copy the right. data that was being created by the 3d accelerator the the main cpu was the just like hot passing plates right and there was some dma behind the scenes i, I know it was very very complicated and complicated but they got 3d graphics out of it and um you know i i, I was lucky enough to work with the folks that that designed the chip and Argonaut itself separated into Arc, which became a chip manufacturer, although mm. subsequently bought out by various folks. They had their own CPU, soft core CPU, which is kind of interesting. And then the technology group, which is what I was actually working with. So I got to work with some of the tech folks from there. And, you know, there's some fascinating things that they, stories that they had. Um, but yeah, so that was, that was actual silicon that was designed and implemented. Um, and, you know, around that time as well was like the beginning of the consoles, and so we were mm-hmm. starting to see these really strange beasts that Sony and Sega and Nintendo uh, were putting together. So I was exposed pretty quickly to these very esoteric, to me, you know, my lovely, beautiful ARM instruction set notwithstanding, right. these strange processors, you know, the Hitachi SH4 uh, in the, the Dreamcast, which is probably my favorite, with its 16-bit uh, inst- fixed width instructions and it's strange addressing modes and, and things like this and you're like well yeah this is this is cool um and you know starting to learn um and have very simple tooling about how multiple issue stuff was going to happen like cpus mm-hmm. that could do more than one thing at a time the arm was pipelined and very beautifully so like everything was done it's like extremely easy to predict what was going on but um with things like the SH4, they were like, well, there were pairs of instructions that you would go together, provided there were no detected hazards between the two instructions, and they were of you know sort of appropriate types, like you couldn't do two multiplies at the same time or that kind of thing. Then they would pair together, and right. so you would see these, uh, uh, you know, or rather you would write. You know, this was still at that time when the, the compiler was good, but it was still pretty worthwhile spending the time to write the assembly yourself. Right, um, and so you would sit there and pair them together. And uh, that was that was a really interesting sort of learning experience. And I, I that's so my GitHub is a mine of like 
nonsense that I've left behind from from the years I've got before. I thankfully got the permission from Jez to to, to publish the source code to this, so you can go and actually have a laugh at the source code. And it's not just mine, obviously, but the the right. renderer is mine. You can go look at some comments from like 2001, I think, that I was writing where I'm swearing and cursing at various things that don't yeah. <laughs> actually work the way they are. And you can sort of see the strange format that I picked up where I was pairing instructions in the assembly, and where there were unpairable instructions, I would put a knob so that I could show. Mm -hmm. And but it was not a real knob; it was a knob that I could hash define in or out. And so I'd assemble it once with the knob in place, and then run it, measure how fast it was, and then I would dis, dis you know, disable. Sorry, get rid of the knob completely, and then mm -hmm. compile it, and then prove that it was the same speed, give or take the fact that the code was a tiny bit more compact. Right? It was a, it was a little bit more, com and that would prove to me that I'd done it right, and I was still pairing the instructions that I thought I was I was pairing. Right. Uh, so that was so, yeah. This yeah, was ahead. all. This was all. Um like explicit instruction level parallelism it wasn't doing the machine itself wasn't doing any of this for it you. it was yeah the machine would would uh, very simply pick up f like four bytes at a time and if it could see mm -hmm. the two instructions were like okay based on it's like the, the the registers didn't overlap and there were instruction types that, that were um, compatible with each other then it could issue them together but okay. yeah it wasn't doing any out of order it was like just two at a time and around the same time actually the the x86 was in the same kind of world this was like um intel had the u pipe and the v pipe they were the two issue stations and you know there was everything I, I never really did much of this but around me in the atg group was the the folks who were writing brenda which was a uh, a, um, a so-called blazing renderer of course these terrible names that we come up with <laughs> but um, Brenda was using a number of games like there was like a middleware um, for a number of games including things like Carmageddon um, and um, uh, Croc PC which was a game I actually worked on and, but the the interesting thing was um, that yeah they were still writing all this stuff in assembly for because it was software rendering pre the you know the beginning of like um, uh graphics cards you know they were they were around but a lot of people couldn't afford them or it was like the 3d effects which was a secondary graphics card you would plug in and then you would have to put a pass-through cable from your vga card that did your 2d graphics up through into the 3d effects and then you'd have another cable that went to your monitor and it would kind of like essentially you could hear the relay click as it went into 3d mode and like took over <laughs> all this kind of nonsense but um, yeah, so there was a lot of, of concentration on like how do we lay out the code so the U and the V pipes are fed so that certain instructions could go in the U pipe and certain other instructions could go in the V pipe and they would be issued together again similarly if they didn't um, have the right, the wrong kind of hazards. Mm -hmm. And then just as I was getting into the PC stuff myself, um, the Pentium uh, Pro was out. I think mm -hmm. it was the Pro. And... Um, I had one of the early prototypes, the Klamaths. It was this huge thing. And for a long time afterwards, actually after the, so spoiler alert, Argonaut folded and a lot of the stuff <laughs> went home with the employees. And my Klamath, this strange prototype went home with me and was my, for the longest time was my dial-up modem, um, like um, gateway machine <laughs> running on like prototype <laughs> property of Intel. Do not <laughs> distribute all over it. Like, shh, fine. Right. Um, <laughs> But anyway, um, but th th at this point was the first time that they were starting to do proper out of order execution, mm. and so we had them come into us and say, "Hey, for, you know all this U and V pipe nonsense that you've been doing? Forget it. Um, you just can't predict what it's going to do anymore. It's so clever. It optimizes for you. Everything's magic. You know, use our compiler. Uh, right. Everything will be fine." Um, just measure it. We have this thing called VTune, which kind of tells you after the effect what happened, and we're, you know great i guess uh and you know there were obviously things that you could see that it was doing but it was we started to consider it at least i started to consider it really a black box of like i just mm -hmm. don't know what magic it's doing um and so around that you know so i spent some time on on pc things um and so just enough to get that kind of exposure around that time and then uh i moved on to xbox and um ps2 which was similarly painful um that one uh the certainly for the vu processors um, there was a uh, dual issue, so it's sort of VLIW style, mm -hmm. um, dual issue with the U and the V pipe were very explicit in this long VLIW thing. And there were no data hazards. You just had to remember, oh yeah, if you do a multiply, it'll get written back on cycle five. You better be ready for it. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but that meant you could interlace things yourself. You could go, well, okay. Right. And so um, I think Carl Graham, who was one of the super effects folks actually he came up with this rather novel spreadsheet programming method 
with macros in the spreadsheet so that you would type the instructions and things and it would like highlight with colors where the result of this instruction comes out down here and then you could work out that it would actually fit and all this and you know it was very painful to do but it was actually necessary at that time there wasn't even a c compiler that could target this stuff because it was so mm. byzantine you know it's so weird and so very special case for geometry processing you know we call it vertex and pixel pixel shaders well vertex and geometry shaders i guess these days um later on they had like a very smart assembler that let you write the assembly without thinking about the hazards and it did the interleaving and the vli wing so it got a little bit better but that was my sort of my first um real foray into oh my gosh there's a lot of things that the cpu could do for us that i've been spoiled into it doing them for me right uh, and is the this one doesn't do it were the uh so i'm i'm not knowledgeable of making games at all uh which is is kind of a uh, i feel like an an uncommon thing but uh, i just have have not had any interest in games themselves but uh, i'm very interested in the hardware that, that goes along with it so i'm curious um you know it, when you're writing uh like you know software that's going to run in a data center you don't really think about the the underlying hardware that much and and I believe now, you know, with game engines and that sort of, well, yeah, we might get into when you do think about the hardware <laughs> sometimes, but, um, with, uh, I believe now like game engines and things like that allow you to kind of, uh, you know, abstract across multiple platforms. Were y'all writing games at that time that were targeted to just a single platform? And was it a lot of work to move from one platform to another or deliver on multiple platforms? So yes and no. Um, I think all of the best games of that era were single platform and they really played to the mm. strengths of their individual platform and there was enough to discriminate between the platforms um, you know like the, the playstation had an insane fill rate it could write the pixels to the screen so quickly um but it could hardly do anything there was no blending modes that it had there were you there were some tricks to doing some uh, um some of the things you would otherwise like to do um but Whereas the Xbox was not so high in the fill rate, but had higher vertex throughput and was easier to work with. Um, but you, you know, so you kind of like you you would trade off of the different different approaches. But yeah, the, so the games that I worked on were actually multi-platform, but we didn't really have a generalized engine. the The engine that me and uh, my friend Nick Hemmings wrote um, became the de facto engine for um, two platforms and a few games around the time. Um, so it, it, it powered the, the game SWAT, which was SWAT Global Strike Team, which was like one of the SWAT franchise uh, games for Xbox and PlayStation 2. PlayStation 2 came along late because at the time we were Xbox exclusive. And so we kind of went mm. to town and I wrote shader language and I wrote a shader compiler that compiled from that, like my own little uh, DSL down to a vertex shader program, which could, you know, calculate all the UVs and a pixel. Sh I, I like, I'd been enamored by toy story and I'd been reading up about how Pixar did things. And I heard about these shader things. I was very excited. And so I did this, all this, this stuff. Um, and they, I mean, that was fascinating. The, the way that the, the systems were working under the hood and how they managed to get the, the, the power that they got out of a very, it was a relatively early NVIDIA part. Mm. Um, and um and interestingly they told us you know we we can't tell you how it works because we have agreements with nvidia um <laughs> it's direct x as far as you're concerned and mm -hmm. then they would cough politely and say but if you look in the header file maybe you'll learn a thing or two and then they walk away you know <laughs> and you right. open up the header file and all of this so uh, direct x is com i don't know if you've ever heard of com or you know about com it's this really have, yeah. janky business thing that like you can query an object for what interfaces it supports and then you say get me that interface and it returns you like essentially it's all c plus plus virtual tables and things behind the scenes or c function pointer arrays or whatever but you look through and you see that it's actually just a bunch of macros that they defined in a header file to make it look just enough like com for you to be able to write com and then very clearly you were being handed back structures that were you know obviously the actual things that were being sent to the hardware like thank right. heaven for that you know we're right. we're able to talk to the hardware <laughs> ourselves because again on these earlier machines like the playstation the playstation 2 um the the dreamcast they essentially just send you the hardware manuals you know poorly translated uh hardware manuals this register does this thing good luck off you go <laughs> it's mapped right. to this memory occasion have fun bye you know <laughs> you know like, oh okay right. um so you were very very much exposed whereas microsoft couldn't expose us at that level because a they had an api they wanted to kind of marketingly say hey it uses direct x and b they couldn't 
breached their contract with nvidia but we got to learn how the nvidia chip was working we understood how the the various like tricks that it was doing and how it was stamping down multiple pixels at once and how it was you know discarding things based on some clever uh, um, tricks behind the scenes it was it was a fun experience to learn that you know cpus don't have to look like you know fetch an instruction run the instruction get on with the next instruction it could be like no fix fix 80 copies of the data run them on little threads that are running the same bit of code but different data you know but not in a simd way in a kind of like parallelized across another way it's like really interesting like how do you hide the latency well you just do another one <laughs> just keep doing right. more of the same one you're doing the fetch right. for the first cycle for loads of them you're like, oh that's really clever i'd never thought of that so that was an eye opener um and i there was a reason we were going this way uh, and i can't remember what it is <laughs> no it was uh no, just uh, targeting a multiple different platforms. Oh, that's um, right. So different platforms. So yeah, we we painted mm-hmm. ourselves into a corner by putting all these whiz bang features into the Xbox, and then then saying like, well, the Xbox isn't doing as well as we'd like. How about we port it for the PlayStation Two? And that was a very painful mm-hmm. um, operation. That's where we grafted someone else's like core core rendering library onto the bottom of our Xbox 3D engine and kind of pounded it until it worked found a number of ridiculous ways of of getting the full screen effects that we had on the xbox using the xbox beautiful blending modes to work on a playstation 2 which were all variants of the theme of if you've got a 24-bit frame buffer in memory but you lie and say no it's an 8-bit frame frame buffer by setting the flag that says it's an 8-bit frame buffer well Mm -hmm. it's actually planar and so there are bits of the way the RAM chip on the graphics unit work map each plane in this particular way, which means that the red pixels are like a 16 by 2 array if you're viewing through an uh, an 8-bit lens of this 32-bit right. buffer. And so you can draw a little set of triangles that just picks out those, and then mm. you can use it as a multiply because it's got an 8-bit multiply. You can do an 8-bit right. multiply, so you can do the red multiply if you do this. But like that's only 16 pixels. Now you have to move... 16 across and grab the next batch of red and then the next one it was zigzagging and all this stuff so you'd end up like sending you know hundreds of thousands of triangles to the system to pluck out the red the green the blue independently to then map <laughs> a, like a full screen red pick triangle a full screen green triangle a blue triangle just to essentially get a 24 bit multiply of red red with red green with green blue with blue you're like you know why does it have to be so difficult but right. it makes you appreciate <laughs> Um, the trade-offs that you make in this design space. My understanding was that the blending modes that were available, so so the blending modes are like, am I replacing the pixel that I'm writing to? Am I adding to it? Am I subtracting from it? Or am I multiplying with it? And this gives you different like uh, transparency or opacity or other Mm. special effects. Mm. But, um, you know, you've got to have a lot of adders and subtractors and multipliers to be able to do that. And I believe the way the PlayStation worked is they pushed the circuitry out to be in and amongst the ram of the uh the frame buffer so that the Mm. the sort of the last stage blending happened with the packet from the the sort of gpu going hey i just want you to do this operation to the ram and i don't have to read it to modify it to write it back again i just send it to you and you do it in place and that's a really cool trick but it means it's really limiting because you can't have all these other blending modes or because you're just blowing up and blowing up the amount of, of silicon you need at least that's my understanding of how it worked. Again, like, this is through a lens right. of like you know twenty twenty years of like hardly remembered things, but yeah. Right. So it was it was it was a challenge to do um, cross platform development. The machines were significantly different from each other. I think you said earlier that like nowadays uh, there's engines are sort of commoditized these days. And I have a friend, I have a friend who still develops um, for for um, Unreal Engine. I still have a, another friend who does con- consultancy work in the games industry. And I said to them, oh, you must do all this stuff still. And he goes, no, not anymore. You know, there's five people in, at, at Epic that do that kind of stuff. And then everyone else just right. uses the engine. And actually, it was a very sad thing that he said to me. He said, like, 90% of the work that we do in games these days is UI work. I'm like, mm. what? It's like well, every game is just another 3D game with whatever textures and animations and stuff, which is all solved problems, right? And AI this and whatever, moving this. And said so like, but every game needs its own unique bespoke shop for you to buy all of the merch right. is how they really make their money. And, you know, like, and so you're writing like web pages in 3D, like drawings and stuff like click and you know, rebates. And it's like very sad how the industry has changed. Right. You, uh, I, I believe after um, Argonaut uh, shut down that you started your, your own company for a period of time. I was curious if, um, I guess, you know, first, 
why uh, you decided to do that and what that experience was like. And, and two, um, if, you know, maybe some of those changes or changes you saw in the gaming industry kind of started to lead you away from, from working in that industry. Yeah, it was definitely... So the, the, the games industry is and probably sorry was and still probably is uh, very crunch heavy you know i was fine mm-hmm. in my 20s when i didn't really have anything else to do and i was my entire life was like doing this kind of stuff that i was happy to spend till very late at night and then go get last orders in the pub and then crash come back again the next day to do it all over again um so yeah as you said argonaut ended up folding it, it went under um and uh around towards the end of this my my friend nick and i the guy who we'd written the the engine with uh we we had been enamored of trying to make the build time lower so c++ is notably very slow to build mm-hmm. not as bad as the, the those folks who are listening who are screaming saying but what about like chip synthesis you like yeah okay we're not in the same <laughs> league as that but but it's still frustratingly slow and there are ways and means of laying out your code in a different structure. Unlike most other programming languages where there's only one way to like do something, in C and C++, you've got a choice about, do I put this in the header file? Do I make it a template? Do I not make it a template? Which has actual structural build time difference uh, um, changes. And so we had this great idea for like, well, we thought a great idea for how to change the way people program. And we were, we were kicking this idea around around the end of Argonaut. And then when Argonaut went down, we looked at each other in, in, in the eye and went, should we give this a go? Mm-hmm. And I, my, 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 my then girlfriend, now wife, had just moved in with me. And so I was like, well, I guess you could help pay the mortgage while, <laughs> while I try out my idea. <laughs> so um, so we, we formed a company called Profactor and we had this idea for s- storing code in a different way so that it was easy to render the code out in a way that was very friendly to the compiler without mm-hmm. the human having to remember, oh, if I pre-declare this rather than not pre-declare it. And you know, all the rules and things that you can do to make your code um, faster to compile, say, or to make it more incremental to build. And then you can render it in a different way and say, like, hey, the compiler can see everything now. This is a so-called Unity build. Um, it'll take it forever, but you'll get a really good build out of it you know nowadays compilers are able to do this kind of stuff without you doing so many of those tricks but they're still sort of relevant anyway we thought it was a great idea we did a whole bunch of technology it didn't work out we ended up making ends meet by doing consultancy for the only thing we knew what to do which is video games so Mm. uh, i got to do uh, a tour of duty at uh, a few places around including rockstar which was cool to 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 work uh with with those folks and see the see some of the code uh yeah, some of the code which you're like, wow, you make a lot of money out of this code. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I'm very glad you do because I wouldn't want to work on it myself. It's really right, complicated right. looking and full of bugs and oh gosh. But it was, it was those were fun times um, and we really enjoyed them. But uh, but uh, and, and yeah, like anything, you get a, a window into another person's world. You know, I'd been at, um, essentially a monoculture at Algonor. It was a big, big company for the time. Um, but, uh, you know... Uh, it was it was only one viewpoint about how to do things. There were, there were teams that differed, but going into a whole other company and going, "Oh gosh, you develop very differently," was was eye opening. Right. And how long did y'all uh, run run Profactor for? Uh, I'd have to. It's a, a few years, three or four years, I think. Um, yeah, something like that. This is where I would bring up my LinkedIn and go and look. I've got right, such a right. bad memory. It's like I don't have to remember anything more. The internet holds it for me, right? Right. <laughs> So right. it was a few years, um, and you know we were doing we were, we were doing fairly well. We had two products out that were actually under our our, our own name. Um, they were essentially small pieces of this big project that we were doing. One was like a a, a C plus plus code formatter, which sounds very you know you could a few regular expressions surely is all you need, but secretly it was our way of actually parsing the entirety of C plus plus into an inter- intermediate representation that we could then re render out like we would re render it for the compiler or for you know various different optimization things except that we could re-render it out and change the white space right that was an easy thing to do so that was our way of getting in a, a, a marketable product that was a plug-in for like visual studio and you know some folks bought it we did all right but not enough to keep the lights on really and then some mm-hmm. other stuff that, that came out um around um following include paths and things again sort of th- thematically correct for our mission but not the actual thing we wanted to get out uh, and then towards the end of that, I, I I had a friend at Google who kept going to the pub with me and sort of saying, oh, I really wish I could tell you what I was doing, but I can't because I am not allowed to tell you 
and after a few years of this you know the interest gets peaked and you're like well all right well maybe all right and so i applied to google um and probably, probably the hardest conversation I ever had was telling Nick uh, our little partnership was like, uh, I'm going to go work for Google. I'm really sorry. Uh. Right. Uh, luckily, he still talks to me. Uh, he works for <laughs> Do- Deep Mind now, actually. He's doing some really cool things oh, that he can't talk to me about now. So he kind of gets me yeah. back. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I went off to Google and uh, immediately got handed a, a Nokia phone, a re- an early Nokia phone and told YouTube needs to work on this. Can you make YouTube work on this? And this was like before people had data plans. It was like hardly any phones even had Wi-Fi on them. So they're like, who is the target market for this? This 320 by 200 pixel screen. Right. You know, and what is, who who even uses YouTube? You know, it wasn't that huge of a deal, at least in my life back then. And so my my life was was optimizing and trying to get essentially game level trickery amongst other things a lot of other things as well but to, to get the, the video to decode reasonably well which mostly meant liaising with the hardware because these things would have hardware mpeg decoders in them and that kind mm. of stuff or but more notably it would be more like going out to san bruno where the head office of youtube was and then groveling to the people who do the service to say yeah this is one phone and it's it's too it's not powerful enough to do full software decoding and it's hardware mpeg decoder is broken and switches red and green around. Um, can you transcode all the videos in a new <laughs> format so that red and green is mixed up just so that this stupid phone can, like... Because we wouldn't have the CPU time to, like, switch them back. Right, <laughs> you know? right. And then so sort of like that eye-rollingly, oh, all right, fine. Um, so they, they actually ended up doing that? Yeah, there were a couple of <laughs> things like that, a couple of workarounds. I don't know that they do it anymore. And they would do it on demand. It would don't, Or when a video had triggered so many... Mm views it was it was an in, a fascinating experience to see how that stuff was done behind it. i'm sure it's vastly different now now 15 years on but like back then it was like hey you could actually log in and i could sort of ls the directory that videos were in and kind of look at them and like wow that's they're just files and it like right. blows your mind <laughs> it's like well of course they're just files but like what were you expecting but right. <laughs> but still so yeah so it's been a couple of years um doing various cell phone based youtube thing so if you used a, a non iphone non android version of youtube back in the day either it, we had like j2ee which was like the java thing that ran on or j2me sorry that ran on phones um then yeah you probably used a bit of my code and then we did latterly pick up on the android stuff that was developed mm. um over in mountain view but uh, so i was in london still at this point in time so I'd had a, a, a you know, Google's a, was a fantastic company. Probably still is. I, I don't know. I, I don't want to make too many comments about that kind of thing. Right. Um, but was um, the uh, it, that's pretty different environment though from your first. You know, Argonaut seems like it was a, a relatively large company, but not to Google scale. And then not Google Pro scale. Factor. Yeah, there were like a couple yeah. of hundred people at its peak. Right. You know, I, I still knew pretty much every single person in the organization, especially having been there eight years. Um, but yeah, Google was, you know, hey, there's 20,000 people. You, you know, even right. on the floor that you're on, there are more people than you'll ever be able to recognize. You're like, wow, it was, it was mind blowing. Was that, uh, but it was a, also, uh, what, was that a uh, kind of like um, informative experience for what you wanted to do later? Like, did, did you have the experience of, oh, this is kind of big and I think I, I prefer something a little smaller? Or was it just, you know, this has its own trade offs and uh, there are pros and cons of each? I, don't think I had that level of introspection going in. I think latterly, <laughs> when yeah. I rationalized my decision to leave, I think that some of those things f- folded in, mm-hmm. in into it. But certainly to start with, it was just amazing. It was, uh, you know, you'd felt like you'd been given the keys to the chocolate factory. Internally, Google is so open. You know, uh, there wasn't really much information about how anything was done. Um, there weren't so many of the white papers out about how their internal stuff worked. And so to be let a mock you know free in and watch all these videos and uh learn how queries were handled and learn how they were doing locking at scale learn how they were doing um some of their like fleet wide profiling and the fact that there may be a person somewhere who's writing you know getting shaving one cycle off of a uh, mem copy and knowing that that's worthwhile i i you know right. i think one of your earlier guests was making these kind of con- uh, uh, mentions that like that that's something you can only do when you have like cloud scale and google were like early in that and it's like wow how amazing is that to be doing uh um that kind of work um you know it's 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 bonkers um 
but yeah, it was great. Um, but then yeah, it was kind of a come down retrospectively to right. realize that I couldn't move the needle. I couldn't move the needle at all. I mean, I, I was still relatively junior in my my world views about how things were, even you know, fifteen years ago. Um, you know, because I'd been lived in this sort of very cloistered world of games, and then I was like, oh, I don't even know how software is really made in professional big companies that are, pro- you know, but it's all the same. <laughs> Anyone who's listening right, to this, right. it's all the same. But um, yeah, so uh, I realized that, yeah, I, being in a satellite office, you know, being in London, which was a big off- office, but mostly was marketing people, um, salespeople, and then, you know, reasonably large uh the division of programmers but they were all essentially to, to cater for the european phones so it was very mobile centric and mm-hmm. so we were seen as a sort of strange backwater in some ways it was hard to even within that make a difference and then it's certainly harder to make a difference within the company as a whole and you know the, the two or three times that i would pop over a year to to mountain view or san bruno or or montreal or wherever um you know you could feel that you were making more of a difference just to having right. two conversations than you were you know beavering away sending um change lists to to people and so yeah i think again that was a post hoc rationalization when i decided to leave um and i ended up in in finance i had a friend who had left google about a year before the the pair of us had um um, worked on uh, like an open source meetup that google sponsored and so we bring in people and we were chatting and so that's how i knew him i didn't work with him directly in google although we were both worked for google it's that we were both like organizer type people that were happy to stand up in front of a bunch of people and talk so we would do that and we would get people in from the london open source community and we'd have presentations and laughs and drinks and all that kind of good stuff and then he left and i didn't really know where he went but i sort of took over open source uh, jam with some other people um i don't know if anyone listens to this then i'm gonna be like no i did it too. Like, sorry yes uh, um and i didn't really think too much of it until about a year later presumably around the sort of non-solicit end of a contract end. he he out of nowhere reached out to me and said hey matt you should probably come and talk for you know come come and have lunch with me i'm like I, what are you doing you, you went to like finance i don't know about that and he said no right. just trust me come for lunch and so i went and met him for lunch and i went around this office and i was like wow, you're solving really interesting performance problems. Mm-hmm. Um, this is not what I was expecting finance to be at all. I was expecting, you know, huge database query type things and all that nonsense. But like, no, there are people that are solving difficult computer science problems. And um, maybe I am interested in this after all. And I went for an interview and they said, sounds great, but not in London, come to Chicago. So I did. Mm-hmm. And this is where I still am now. 13 years on uh it turns out that that very thing that you were saying earlier about why on earth do we need to know how computers work these days and uh, with these huge uh, data centers full of machines doing whatever that is true for 99.9 percent of the world but for the point one of the remaining percent world that is the finance industry or the mm-hmm. hyperscalers doing their web serving probably as well in fairness but we care about that stuff and so suddenly I've been thrust back into the same joyous position that I started in when I was 10, 15 years old, learning assembly to get more sprites on the screen and coming up with crazy ways of like jiggering around things to get another one cycle's worth of in my loop to, for, for performance reasons. Um, except that now instead of like cycle counting on a, a, a two megahertz machine, I've got the fastest CPU that, that we can throw money at cooled uh, as much as we can possibly cool it with all of the trimmings turned on and you know like all of hyper threadings turned off why would we want hyper threading that steals away from the cores that we we carefully have crafted to do that right. thing you know we <laughs> we carefully manage our thermal stuff you know like pin to these cores isolate them in the in the operating system don't run anything on those other cores because if you do it heats it up and then we lose power from the other one you know that kind of nonsense and you're like wow this is fun again now we're right, right. like back to where we care about what's really happening under the hood and uh, you know obviously that's even in our world that kind of excitement that i'm demonstrating represents 0.1 percent of the job right you know everything else is just like everyone else's stuff of like well we still have to write the tests we still have to write the code and someone has to write the build system and we have to kind of deploy it and we have to make sure that it's right and all that good stuff but yeah every now and then you're like okay how are we going to make this go fast and right knowing how the hardware works at a deep level 
even though most of the time you're floating above seven or eight layers above it, abstraction layers above it, is still fun and exciting. And that's when I started looking into microarchitecture. So I picked up on the thread that I dropped when the Intel engineers had told us to just use VTune. Right. And I was like, no, no, there must be a way of understanding this. It's tractable, surely. Surely somebody has worked this out. And by this point, people had started seriously reverse engineering how Intel processors work and that was an eye-opener for me mm -hmm. and the fact that they then published how they did it and you could learn tricks and techniques for taking the chip inside your computer and like running experiments and going well this must be what this thing is then wow i'd never really thought of that and so that was a huge uh, moment in my life of like going wow we can understand this we can rationalize it we can even measure it some of the times with intel's own tools that they don't really specify very well for obvious reasons but right yeah exciting exciting stuff and, and so what what are some of those like resources i, I want to talk uh, about the the finance uh, world because i think that's uh particularly uh opaque especially to folks on the outside um which there's there's probably that's probably going to impact maybe some of the things we can talk about but to um, some extent I, yeah but i mean yeah yeah i've had i've had some exposure um i went to university in in st louis and um and so we would go up to Chicago to the high frequency trading firms and they'd have like these competitions where you, it was basically like algorithmic trading competitions and they would do a simulation. Um, so I got a little bit of exposure, but I am interested to dive into that, but I would be remiss if I didn't dig in on, you mentioned some of those resources right. um, that you've been able to use to kind of do some of that reverse engineering and experimentation. Uh, what, what are some of those? Well, so the first one is the sort of the Bible by Agna Fogg who was this sort of very uh, interesting person from a, some Nordic country. I think he's a professor of, of, um, of something un unusual. It's not actually computer science or anything like that. It's, it's some, some, something else. But he's got a, a passionate interest in reverse engineering. And he's written these PDFs that are like fully take, take apart of the, the pipeline of all of the major revisions of, of the Intel pipe, uh, Intel mm. um, line of chips, you know, starting from the, the earliest Pentium 3 all the way through to modern day Core 2 um, type processors. And, you know, he explains everything that he's been able to work out in a very accessible way. And like, it's one of those things where I don't know if you have anything like this in your life where once a year I reread it anyway. Just though, even though right. I think I know it, there's stuff that I miss. And I've got, there's two or three books that fall into this category. I've got Bjarne Struestrup's like Tour of C++, which is a small book. But every time I read it, I go, oh, I don't think I knew you could do that. You know, it's a huge language, right? Um, another one is Agner Fogg's um, performance uh, manuals. Um, I think the third one, if you go to his website, which is delightfully 1990s era white website with the most disgusting background color and <laughs> animating gifs and things across the top you really honestly feel like you've fallen into a myspace from yeah the 90s or two, early 2000s right. <laughs> and it's you know it's, it's, it's a it's a choice right <laughs> that's, that's thing that tells you who he is um so i'll read that and then there's also uh charles petzold's um annotated mm. turing which is uh, a fad, fantastic book of just you know like learning where this whole thing started and how it came out of one person well obviously lots of people have contributed over the years but like there's such a defining st story of uh how computers came to be in a very abstract way you know that's about as abstract as you can possibly get with an actual turing machine and it's infinite piece of tape and you're like well that's very different actually uh <laughs> right um, right but um yeah, so the resources that he gets, first of all, you know, he's 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 done the research and he's got the receipts and he can show you the receipts, but he's also written a quite a very accessible um, prose around how all these things fit together, what the various stages are, uh, how long things take in general, what the various execution ports are on the x86, how many there are, what types of instructions go to which ports. Um, how retirement happens, how the register files accessed, how there's... The, and, and a lot of this stuff comes because, like, Intel want to be able to tell you where the bottleneck is in your code. They won't tell you exactly what's going on, but there's probably a counter somewhere with a name right. in the manual which just says reg file stall or something like that with like number of registers file stalls. And that's all it'll say. And then you can go, well, uh, let's write an experiment. How many instructions can I queue up to access different registers that haven't been re renamed, which is another thing, right? So I'm going to thousands of knobs beforehand so that everything's out of the rename buffer. Okay, let's try these things and go, oh, I can do four, I can do five, oh, six, it stalls. Okay, and this counter started going up. That kind of 
feel right and so he right. he he has an open source project as well which you can go and fiddle with and you know you 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 can use to sit up and tweak little experimental pieces of code and so he, that's that's one of the main resources and yeah again that's something you re, you can reread over and over again and then and always learn something new uh, similarly, there's um, I don't know the folks behind it, but the uops.info is a website that has essentially all the XML or JSON or YAML or whatever description of every single instruction that there ever is or was for every single architecture they could possibly run the code on. And then you get like, well, this is how many cycles delay it is. This is the reciprocal throughput. This is all these other things. These are which ports we observed it going through. So this goes through ports 0, 1, and 2, but not 3 or 4, or those kinds of things. And then they have um, some of their own code as well, which um, at some point I will integrate into a website uh, to, to make it available to all um, that does a very good job of like a Python-based simulator of all of this stuff. And they've kind of done a, there's a paper out somewhere that describes the process by which they went through the process by which they went through to get to the, the sort of almost one-to-one -one mapping with the real hardware, which I thought was totally impossible. You know, like here I am sweating over getting a 1980s era computer with uh, like very, very simple to be perfectly in sync with uh, the reality. And then they're like, no, we can write a Python program that can simulate this tens of billion transistor monstrosities that we build these days. Right. <laughs> so those are some of the resources. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I my own tiny, tiny, tiny contribution to this was trying to reverse engineer how the branch predictor uh, worked under some circumstances one of those things where like i thought i'd read this thing on the forum over and over again oh yeah the, the branch prediction blah 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 it always assumes that branches backwards are true because uh, they're presumably a loop and branches right. forwards are false and i've like got it in my head like well the thing is it doesn't even know that there's a branch there until it's decoded the branch which is actually five or six pipeline stages from the fetch and so it's right. already too late at that point so there's all these various different well you know if there's a branch here um, and if it's a conditional branch, you've already done all this work. Maybe you should just let it fall through, mm -hmm. right? Also, how do you know if you've seen this conditional branch before or not? Because most branch prediction algorithms these days use some kind of hashing function that kind of hashes the branch, the pattern, the phase of the moon, yesterday's <laughs> lottery results, comes up with a number, right. and then it looks in the table there, and it doesn't know whether it, this is really for this branch or not. It doesn't store tag right. bits, because it's like, well, I, if it isn't, what am I going to do? I might as well come up with a guess. Right. Um, and then, so, you know, you think, well, if it doesn't know the branch has been in the table before or not, that it's actually for this branch, then how can it predict forward or backwards? Because either it's too late, because it's already run through the pipeline, it might as well carry on, or it's got a prediction, and the prediction... It doesn't know if it's for this branch anyway. So so I wrote a whole bunch of stuff about this and um, I had access to a, like a really a, my, a weird server machine I had in my basement, still in my basement, in fact, still my main server. Uh, and so I ran all these experiments and it found some really interesting patterns in the way that it, um, the branch target buffer, which is, I think, a thing that one doesn't think about with branch prediction. I certainly, when I talk to, to, to folks, like in an interview setting, we talk about branch mm -hmm. prediction and it's always, is the branch taken or not, right? That's right. what most people think of. But like, it's like, is there a branch there at all is the question you need to ask before you even start fetching. Because like I right. said, it'd be five cycles on. You've like finally decoded the world and you've gone, oh, there's a branch here. And you're like, well, too late. The train's already gone down that route <laughs> ahead of you. Right. So you have to kind of predict if there's a branch there at all and then where the heck it's going to because decoding the destination is half of the, the trouble. So, and obviously... A lot of branches are not conditional. They are jumps or they're calls or they're rets or whatever. And so trying to make that prediction happen early is what the branch target buffer is doing. And then secondly, if and only if it's conditional, is it taken or not, right? <laughs> so, right but we right. always think about the conditional or not conditional thing. So um, anyway, I was doing this whole bunch of analysis on the branch target buffer. And then my one type micro claim to fame is when the, the, um, the, the paper came out about... Um, and so, yeah, when the, the paper for Meltdown and Spectre came out, I, uh, I got a little footnote in the, 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 as, a, as a citation saying, like, this is how some of the ways that you can predict where the branches are mm. going to go or what or not. And I was like, wow, this is my first, like, proper security <laughs> paper right. thing that cites me. I mean, it's literally like the, the bottom of the list of things. But, you know, it was cool. I, I, yeah, that's awesome. I, I think... That's very cool. Yeah. Um, it, kind of circling back around to um you know getting into the the uh, finance industry and, and some of these performance qualities maybe like 
I don't I don't think you know I have enough context to even ask the appropriate questions. So maybe even start from the uh, like immediate differences in terms of the infrastructure uh, and compute that you're using and how you'll manage that and how that's set up as maybe in contrast with, you know, at one extreme, maybe you're using like a public cloud provider, but even for folks yeah. that are uh, using, you know, are hosting their own racks and that sort of thing, uh, wh where does kind of finance start to diverge at that highest level? So, you know, obviously we have a ton of normal needs and requirements and they have their sort of so we have our own internal clouds and things to run like big batch jobs and there's a lot of like you know data gets shuttled around and it's not latency sensitive or even particularly performance but um and, and finance or certainly trading is a huge 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 wide diverse um pursuit uh mm -hmm. and it, it you know like in my current company we have some things that are we're trying to predict the future in months time and then you know it doesn't really matter how quickly you predict something that's happening in three months time because you've still got three months to take advantage of it right you know right. oh so it took 10 seconds sure that's fine i've written the whole thing in python it takes you know 10 seconds to run and that's absolutely fine no one's no one's going to bat an eyelid of that um obviously if you're making a prediction that's five minutes in the future now 30 seconds if it took you 30 seconds to make a prediction that's eroded into your prediction it's now like your prediction is already 30 seconds old by the time you've made it and you're like okay I can see that's problematic. So, um, you know, and we might want to make predictions at all these different horizons. You know, canonically, you know, like real estate folks will buy up large swathes of land and hope, you know, and that's one, right. that's a perfectly valid thing to do and hold that for years and hope that it goes up in value. Um, on the far other extreme, you've got low latency traders who are more colloquially known as high frequency tra traders, which is sort of less true because you can be you could trade once a day and if it's the right trade you can make a lot of money if you're very low latency right. but you know f trading a lot isn't always a good thing although there are strategies that do do that but at that point you are peering down a microscope at every single packet coming in and out of your network so the way that most financial institutions like exchanges the places you can buy and sell shares or options or futures or whatever that work is that you have usually a tcp connection to the server so it, like a regular a bit like a you know web server style thing but it's a persistent connection with a relatively simple protocol to say i'd like to send an order and then it would say congratulations you've now you're now the proud owner of 100 shares of google you're like thank you very much it cost you this much whatever that kind of thing right so that's on the one hand now the public exchanges that are uh, so-called lit and not in the youth term of like awesome and cool <laughs> lit but like um not dark if you've heard of dark pools and dark exchanges that kind of thing that means that they actually advertise and publish the information about what's going on inside their exchange in real time mm -hmm. so every time i place an order uh, it's a bit like going on eBay and registering that you would like to buy something, which is not actually what you do on eBay. I guess you, you, you register you want to sell something and you put a price, right? And then maybe you've got a buy it now price. And it, that means that I can then look at it after the effect, after you've placed it and go, oh, I will buy that actually. And you click the buy button and you get it, right? So, but there are sort of two stages to that. One stage is you register that I would like to buy it or sell it at a particular price. And then if that happens to match anyone who's currently on the system and you're they're buying and you're selling and the prices agree and they're all they're better, then there's a match and the trade happens. But if it doesn't, it goes onto like a bulletin board of like, here's what everybody wants to buy or sell. And that's what mm -hmm. market data is. It's the information that flows off of the exchange that says, here is the interest to buy this particular share. Somebody would like to buy 100 shares of Google for $100. You're like, I bet they would. <laughs> right, <laughs> because right. the pr current price of Google is like 1000 or whatever it is, right? You know, um, right. And there's nothing really to stop. You know, There are certain people who can place these orders in the market. It's not everyone. You can't just go on, you can't register on your Fidelity account or your, you know, your uh, right. Robin Hood account and do this. But you, you reach certain criteria and then you get this TCP connection and you get this um, data stream, which is essentially... Um, everything that possibly happens if you think of it as a database of orders that the exchange is holding every ad remove every trade every modify every exogenous event that could possibly happen on the exchange that affects its internal state is broadcast literally broadcast or in fact multicast to mm -hmm. all interested participants and then you're expected to update your internal idea about what the market looks like from that change so you know you're trying to keep your internal database up to date with what's really going on in the exchange and then you run your magical mystical algorithm over it and go oh i think it's mispriced and so you'll go and buy it or no actually i will join the market and i will also say that i would be prepared to sell google for 
a thousand and one dollars or whatever and you know that's where the real right. magic happens and then clever maths people work it all out and then they they tell me how they would like it to work and then then, then i get involved again right i don't get involved in that bit um and there are there are a set of things you know like there are certain things that are very much like you can boil that information down into signals that you can feed to a machine learning system which then churns out some expected value and then you can make a decision based on that expected value and that tends to be somewhat slow because you're doing some level of post-processing on that data and maybe you're matching it up with the other markets and other symbols and other things that are going on and you're throwing it through a model that's sort of relatively expensive to 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 operate and then you're making mm-hmm. a decision and you're turning it around and then you're sending an order say hey i'd like to buy this and you know at that level you might be talking about hundreds of microseconds which is you know a long time in our world but also not right. a very long time in most other people's world right or it could be milliseconds <laughs> right. even or whatever but um and then as you get down and towards um trades that are that require less um finesse less mm-hmm. like inference and they're more like well if the price of apple suddenly shoots up maybe the price of google maybe it's just a signal that all tech stocks are going to go up you know if you believe that right in which right. case why don't you just quickly, as soon as you see the price of Apple go up, buy all of the other tech stocks and then hope that you get in before everyone else does and you buy while they're still low before they've actually caught up with the price of Apple, assuming that's a, a valid thing to do. Again, this is not financial advice. Please consult. Right. Your, your, <laughs> right. Um, but these are the kinds of things, you know, and at that point we call those lead lag trades where there's a very obvious like economic reason for two things to be linked and then the only reason they're not linked is either because something idiomatic has happened in the world like i don't know mm-hmm. apple have just cancelled their uh, dry, self-driving car thing and now <laughs> whoops the, it's not the tech sector that's going up it's apple that's going up and now you're left holding like all these sh- shares that you didn't want and that's a risk right. that you have to take as a, 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 a as someone who's trading or um you know, Apple went up and then it's a race between you and everyone else who knows that when Apple goes up, Google is going to go up as well. Right. And then, you know, there it's now you're playing. Now you're back in the game, video games of industry where you're like, well, everyone's got the same Dreamcast because everyone's bought the same high powered C- uh, computer. Everyone's bought the same high powered networking card and they're using the same tricks to access the network card through uh, kernel bypass. There's no kernel involved at all. They've all got the same fast switches. They've all paid the exchange the same amount of money to get the same length of fiber optic cable, I kid you not. Right. Um, to So that you have the like essentially a level playing field level amongst all the people who can afford to do all these things, right? right. But level right. nonetheless. <laughs> and so the only thing that remains between you and the, 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 the other person down the road at jump trading as opposed to you know hrt or whatever the trading company is how smart can you how fast can you make this go mm. right how can i craft this to be faster and there was a time when that was all cpu all the time and that was really that was kind of the t- i came in sort of the middle to the end of that part part so like a lot of stuff that i was doing was 100 percent cpus it was these exotic network cars these exotic kernel bypass things and then during the time that i was there people started going well you know what's even faster than the cpu well it's not faster than the cpu but if you're only doing if this then this and you've got right. network packets coming in we can do this in hardware and we can push it out to the edge even further and have an fpga do this mm-hmm. and then you're into the world of like well something you could never do on a cpu is like hey by the time you get to the 15th byte of the packet coming in you know if it's a buy order or a sell order and you can start going oh and you start sending a packet the other way so that as the light, the laser beams on this way, you started turning on the other and going, well, maybe we'll want to sell something on this. And then you get to the end of the thing and just make a decision as it's flow, flowing through to say, okay, yeah, then we'll buy now. Or uh, actually, no, let's not do that and put something at the end. That either I mean, you're not, not so allowed to corrupt packets or anything like that, but there are ways and means of, of like getting to the end and going, I didn't mean to do that, actually. You know, I, I jumped the mm-hmm. gun a little bit. But that's how folks are able to get down to nanoseconds between an action coming in and their reaction going out is they're actually pipelining between the incoming and outgoing events, which is kind of mind boggling. Right. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that is fascinating. I, uh, I've, I've had a kind of personal fascination with FPGAs mostly because, you know, it gives you that world into uh micro architecture and that sort of thing. Absolutely. Without, yeah. Without having to fab a chip, which uh, turns out to be, uh, diff- it's getting easier, Reasonably. but <laughs> it is. It is actually. I was going to say there are there are ways and means these days. You know, like yeah, but but it's still 
<laughs> not as easy as just like plugging your little USB thumb drive like thing into the side of your machine, running some right. open source software and having the LED blink you know, and go, oh, that's cool. <laughs> right. I'm a it, hardware designer. <laughs> right. Right. And, uh, you know, in terms of the kind of like uh, you, you have a, a pretty uh, a large distance in your stack there. Right. You have you have kind of like the interface that I'm sure folks that are doing trading or perhaps some of the um, folks designing models, you know, need to be able to interact with all this data that's being maintained. You have, you know, typical networking software and that sort of thing. You might have um, some of that kernel bypass side of things, and then you're doing like RTL on the FPGAs and that sort of thing. In, you know, I'm sure this varies quite a bit in the size of the organization and, you know, just the organizational style. But is it typical for, you know, engineers at um, trading organizations to be kind of working up and down that entire stack? I don't know how typical it is, um, actually. You know, we, the, certainly organizations I've worked in have had folks who specialize in, in different areas of that. You know, you've got the folks who are, I mean, like, usually the FPGA designers are their own breed. There, mm-hmm. with I've got two noteworthy exceptions to that, who are both software engineers, and I think they, first and foremost, and then they went into the uh, a bit of hardware design, and they are absolutely, you know, it's fascinating to see it through their eyes because I think you know if you've been brought if you've come from the hardware design um, standpoint, you're used to certain things like the aforementioned almost infinite build times, the really very rigorous testing, the extremely um, process driven way of doing everything the very regimented source code you know you if you if you, you can see like a dyed in the wool uh vhdl or verilog engineer because all their comments line up beautifully and everything is formatted within an inch of its life because if your compile is going to take 14 years it may as well be beautiful <laughs> right right. <laughs> right or seemingly that seems to be the, the the rationale between behind it um and then if you come in as a software engineer you're like immediately this is terrible i hate everything about this and you start going what can i do to make this better and then you start discovering like these python based projects that can do simulations so that you can run your tests using like python and async stuff in python and you know then interacting with the verilog simulator and and you know, like it's just a better world and these folks go look over you're like what on earth are you doing over there surely you should be writing lots of system verilog and then writing out thousands of lines and then going home and coming back two days later you know over right. the weekend and looking at the result and like you know like no i, I just i'm i've got too much adhd tendencies to, to, to be right. able to have the patience to do that so it's mm. been fascinating seeing their journey go through that and they've been very successful mm. and i think you know the folks actually behind the was it coco tb i think is the name of the python project that i alluded to mm-hmm. i think they also had a similar like software engineer first mindset and i don't mean to impugn the hardware designers who'll be listening to this, but it's just a really interesting to see a different perspective of it and understand, you know, like the the trade offs, and and also I think for for us as software engineers to learn the humility of like how mm-hmm. how long this process is and how painful this process is, and like how less caval- how much less cavalier you can be about testing, for example, when it's that expensive to find a mistake and fix it. Um, compared to, oh, I guess we just cut a new build and do it again. <laughs> you know, like, oh, no, we've actually got to go through another two, two-night two build process and P&L and then <laughs> all that kind right. of stuff. So, And yeah. if the, uh, you know, when, when you are getting to uh, levels where, you know, you're, you're doing things on the nanosecond scale, the, I imagine, you know, when, when new hardware is released that, it's pretty important to evaluate that and decide whether to incorporate it, right? If it's going to give you a competitive advantage. Now, if you are, well, you know, there's the FPGA hardware as well, which could be a separate conversation, but let's just, you know, focus on maybe like CPUs or something right, like that. Right, right. How, how often are y'all turning over hardware in that environment? Cause I imagine that, you know, as soon as there's something better, it, it's, you know, optimal to, to move over to that system. So in the in the work that I had done before, and without going into too much detail, like it, it became increasingly less important. We had mm-hmm. moved to FPGA stuff, and then the, the 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 speed of the CPUs was more like how quickly can we reprogram or at least configure these FPGAs to do the thing that we're we want to do. I mean, this is I think this is fairly common that the folks um, gravitate towards an FPGA design where you have like essentially. A CPU, a software-defined CPU that's like right. extremely tailored for deep packet inspection and if then else kind of state machine type things. And then the else is here's a block that I need to be sent out. But mm-hmm. 
because you can't really make any deep maths, you can't do any huge maths, mathematical things in, the, uh, in that, you're, you're really looking for particular key characteristics of the messages coming in. And so behind the scenes, there's the clever program written in C++ or whatever that's doing the real thinking and then going like, okay, I need to continually update and re send these if then else rules because mm. i can see the big picture i know that a, a move in apple more than two ticks will mean this kind of message will come through with the byte three being this and byte seven being that that's what i need to get over to the fpga because it's too dumb to really understand what's going on it can only look for like you know a regular expression style thing so i just have to keep changing the regex to find the thing that i want to find and then hope mm. that it is actually finding that signal when it comes out of the noise i mean again I'm trying to blur it a little bit because I'm a bit vague right. on like uh, like how much I, I should be saying about this stuff. And I don't do this anymore for what it's worth. In my current company, I've moved on from, from the company where I was doing the lower latency stuff and it's much more quantitative trading. So it's a bit longer term, um, but it's still important to be fast. Anyway, so to your question about like whether uh, we were always on the cutting edge of CPUs, we weren't actually. It's, it's mm. It was relatively expensive to make those changes. You know, we have, these things have to be put in physically co-located data centers next to the exchange where they're trading for all the reasons of the cable needs to be the right length and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, you normally need a lot of them. You know, you've got like 20 or 30 servers in a rack with these super fast switches in, and these careful cut through things and these companies that make... Um, almost like a phys physical based um switch technology so they can you can split a beam in two send one off to one machine one off to another machine so it's not even really a switch in between them they both get a copy of the data or right. you know one goes off to your packet capture system um and one goes to your you know your trading system so you always have the exact thing that happens so you can do your simulations later and all that kind of good stuff um and so, like the changing the machines out, we, you know, they're, they're each you know you've got twenty of them in a rack, and they're all like twenty five grand each. That's that's a significant um, outgoing. Um, that's not to say that we didn't do it, um, and you know, we, there was definitely experimentation with unusual um, hardware. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, without going into too much detail there, uh, but I'll talk about one thing that I thought was an interesting one in terms of what it was. Sure. Um, so the um, there is a chip called a Tylera which was a relatively simple 32-bit RISC CPU, except it was a grid array of them on a single die. And mm. there were like either 64, I think, 64 of them, something like that, or 16 of them. I think there were 64 arranged in a you know 8 by 8 grid. And the peripherals hung around the chip on the outside. And so the, the, the sort of 8 at the top and the six and then the eight and the six whatever however you want to think of it the, the peripheral literal peripheral um, cpus right. could talk to the pins on the way outside you know they were all fully functional right they all had access to ram if you wanted to and all that kind of nonsense but a way of configuring it would be to say well i'm gonna run linux on these top the top two left left hand corner ones um the rest of them are uncommitted and then i'm going to run dedicated programs on them and some of their registers would be like north south east and west and if you wrote to north, it would block until the processor above you had read from south. So maybe with a small FIFO in between them, something like this. Right. Um, there was also a, an on-chip network where you could send messages through uh, to a particular CPU cell. And it used like you know, New York taxi cab routing algorithm of like, if, if no one's reading or writing from north or south, then I'll go north or south. Else I'll go east and west until I'm lined up left, right or whatever. But anyway, right. what it allowed you to do was in software do the kind of things that you do or you have to do naturally on an FPGA or an ASIC-based solution. You know, effectively, each of these things was a software pipeline stage. And so you could sit there and be like, okay, the Ethernet chip is up here and it writes 64 bytes or 64 bits of the Ethernet frame to the east every time it comes in. And the next, the next uh, program is decoding the Ethernet frame, looking for the, the IP header. And then once the IP header is good, it then starts passing the UDP payload to East and then the UDP payload gets to the next guy and he's like adding, like looking for the particular things and decoding and then going, well, I'll go South if it's this kind of pack or East if it's another one or North maybe. And then you can kind of actually define a physical route round the chip to get to a place where um, you are able to process particular sequences 
very efficiently because every clock cycle, another 64 bits is going through or every other clock cycle or whatever it was. And that's right. very similar to how you have to think about the world when you're doing hardware because everything's parallel. You know, like every transistor is its own little computer and you right. don't really have much choice about it. You know, and in fact, we have to kind of impose our clock based will upon it rather heavily to make it look like the kind of thing that we're expecting where everything moves along one step at a time. And that, that, this is an aside, but it was always a thing that made me laugh. Once I spent some time with our FPGA engineers uh, and really started, I believe, to grok the way that they thought about the world, the way that you have to do things, and the way that you can get this amazing speed up if you do it this particular way on an FPGA, I then we would have people come in and say, um, like vendors would come in and say, take your C++ code and compile it to FPGA, and you get the mm-hmm. huge boost of speed. And I'm like going, it's... The compilation is not the problem. Which language you right. specify in it is not the problem. The problem is you have to think about it in a fundamentally different way. Mm-hmm. And anyone who's trying to write C++ is not thinking about how to, I don't know, uh, do a, a, a 256-way hardware lookup because you're willing to dedicate 256 comparators or however many you can multiplex in and just go, well, this is fine. Like nine-tenths of my chip real estate is this set of comparators. But you know right. what? In one clock cycle, I know if it's interesting or not, right? And you can't do that in C++ um, or any high-level language, really, other than than, than these these uh, uh, HDLs. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I feel like the the area in in doing kind of like rtl myself that really uh took a while to get used to is um you know like if you chain more logic together the propagation delay is gonna increase right and i know uh, you don't really think about that when you're writing uh you know a sequential program or something like that i mean you obviously think about the perhaps the number of struct instructions that are maybe i mean maybe you do but yeah yeah i mean that's that's bonkers you know uh I think your first guest, Philip, was talking about like the ripple car- carries and then the, mm-hmm. the kind of look ahead things. And then there's, you know, if you start going down that Wikipedia minefield of like, uh, uh, like, oh, what about this idea? What about this? Idea? And you think about how do they do multiplies? Oh my gosh, that's even more complicated. And how right. how do they do divides? And that's one of my favorite things actually to teach, you know, incoming sort of fresh faces is to sort of say, um, you know, give me your best guess as to how many cycles these things will take. And then you sort of go through the list of things and then you say integer division. And they're like, I don't know, 20? You're like, well, maybe 200. Uh, it depends. Yeah, right. you know, actually, <laughs> the latest revision of Intel processors are now down to like teens again, I think, for, for even 64-bit oh, wow. divisions. And I just... I, I would love to know how they're doing it, you know, or maybe somebody just screaming into their, again, to their headphones right now that like, it's obvious, but like, it has long been like the thing that I just think, you know, because we can do a floating point multiply or a floating point division in don't really think about it anymore now kind of level of time, as opposed to back in the games industry where it's like everything was fixed point uh, until right. floating point became, you know, com- uh, commonplace. Um, and to think that you can't, you know, do a division. And you think, well, when do I do an integer division? Why would I care? It's like, well, every time you use a hash map, you're modding with the size of the hash map most of the time. And that's a division with a remainder. And that's actually kind of expensive. And you're like, oh, I hadn't, I hadn't thought of that. Yeah, you're like, yeah. <laughs> right, right. You know, it's right. like, if you, you know, a total aside, if you look at the um, implementations of really fast hash maps, they usually have a switch statement for, they do switch on like the, how big is my table? They don't store the size of the table in terms of like is it like five you know one oh two three you know whatever appropriate nearly power of two but prime size right. they switch on the ordinal value of which it is is it the you know is it uh, 13 or is it 252 or no that's obviously not prime sorry <laughs> whatever and then they just do return x mod that and so the compiler sees it's a constant and so you're you're trading off, and the compiler then can do magical tricks to make it not actually a divide. It's modulus with a constant, which is a division with a constant, and there are tricks to use multiplies and other things that are much much cheaper. Um, so these fast hash maps are going are trading off on the. There's a branch predictor mismatch maybe because I have to jump to the right sequence of instructions, but that's faster than doing the darn divide in the first place, which is just like right. bonkers. But nowadays maybe it isn't, you know. <laughs> who knows the number of instructions right. you see and I know this is like getting towards like the uh perhaps the a, a destination for where the heck they we're going in this conversation <laughs> but like the number of instructions isn't necessarily a great 
um, indicator of how fast things are going to be. Right. You know, the, the, these things like divides will take longer or maybe they won't these days. You know, it's, it's yeah, it's fascinating how, how, uh, how complicated these things we've built are. <laughs> right. I, I'm curious, you know, one of the things that um, I've kind of, uh, in, in having this experience of talking to folks uh, who, you know, worked on uh, processors in the 70s and 80s, and, and kind of where we started this conversation as well about talking about the simplicity and the elegance of them and, and really the determinism, I feel like, is the, the yes. key thing there. And, yeah. you know, when you when you start to see some of the vulnerabilities, you know, you mentioned uh, Spectre and Meltdown, um, you kind of at some point start to wonder, are we are we actually making progress here, <laughs> you know? And um, obviously, like, you know, there's been uh, lots of uh, improvements due to uh, some of these microarchitecture concepts. You know, you mentioned branch prediction and pipelining and some of those things. But I I'm curious, you know, in your own experience, um, do you feel frustration with the, the increasing level of complexity? And do you think there's uh, perhaps like a, a ceiling where we're actually getting perhaps diminishing marginal returns from from continuing so that's a really really interesting question i mean i i do honestly miss the days when i would have the hardware manuals open in my lap and then you could make very strong guesses as to what would happen you know like i know how many cycles this device is going to take i know how many cycles it takes to draw a, a triangle this big so i can do something and then i can go back to it when it's finished those were great times um but that's that was eroding even towards the end of my time in say the games industry because people wanted for commercial reasons actually in this particular instance people would like interpose well we want to put like a kind of operating system so that we can have a pop-up display above your game and you know show that your friend has just logged in and all this kind of stuff you're like oh wait wait i'm not in control anymore yet no 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 no. you're nearly in control but we have this thing behind you so you know we started to lose that determinism even then although it was still fairly deterministic for you but um the the sheer gains that we've gotten and every time i think we've reached the point where we couldn't possibly squeeze any more out of it somebody clever does something else uh, and you're like oh wait the oh that's smart you know register renaming that's clever mm -hmm. now suddenly it doesn't matter that we have a puny register file because you know it's actually as big as we can fit onto the chip or you know branch prediction hey we can we're so good at guessing where you're going that we can afford to have 100 plus instructions in flight even though the vast majority of them we have no strong belief that they are the right ones yet but it's right. fine because most of the time we're right and of course we lose the determinism but we go so much faster so much of the time that uh, it, it does seem to um, undo the, the the harm, but then you know, you spe as again, spectre and meltdown, and the difficulty of solving those while also maintaining um, the performance that we we've come mm -hmm. to expect is so is is so tricky. Um, yeah, I I'm you know I think you know the the. I think Thomas, it was you. You spoke to about like VLIW and Itanium, and, and so there was some sort of like sensitivities around the either failure or not of that. But you know, one of the things you know, and this is coming from somebody who has made a sort of side career about saying how clever compilers are and how we should trust them to do everything smart, right? Um, I don't see that there are enough ways for a compiler to be smart enough, given how dynamic the flow of execution is in most mm. cases. Mm -hmm at least in my experience, right? And I've seen, um, I can't think what the heck, the, the belt computer with the, these straight, like, almost like conditionals built into the instruction where you can do one or this or that. And obviously the arm had its beautiful, originally at least it's, you know, conditional stuff so that you could like do some clever things with, with, with that. But like really um, nothing beats the ability for the silicon to just go well i can i can try all the parts it's almost quantum like i will go ahead of you and i will start looking and i will make guesses and, and as long as the guesses are better than even we're still better off than me not doing the guesses at all as long right. as i can afford the silicon and obviously that's where the trick is it's not really the silicon it's mm -hmm. the heat that it generates when it's running and the power right. that it takes and and that kind of stuff which then limits how much can be on at the same time and all that kind of stuff but it's yeah i've been remarkably surprised how how often the, and the next generation comes out and it's still faster somehow you know we've got however many levels of cache you're like how can this be helpful like there's so much going on between and then you're like you learn that each level of the cache has its own independent prefetching unit that's like also intuiting from the flow of instructions and the flow of misses where you're going and starting to run ahead of you you're like good grief uh, uh, 
there are so many little robots running around making their own decisions in here. It's a miracle that it works as well as it does. But there's doesn't seem to be much sign that it's slowing down, despite you know the fact that I don't really like that I can't easily tell what's going to happen. <laughs> Right. It does. It does feel like, you know, you mentioned uh, kind of like the the heat issues, which, you know, eventually uh, kept us from continuing to clock processors faster right. and faster and faster. Where's my 10 um, gigahertz processor? Right. You know, that never right. happened. <laughs> right. And, you know, there's there's other things that pop up. Like uh, I know as we like shrink the process node the issues with leakage and things like that, you know, start to happen with transistors. We start so, getting quantum computers, even though we don't want them. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So there's like the, the physical aspect of it, you know, alluding to, you know, er, your earlier statement about there's always a lever, but a level beneath your abstraction, layer, no matter how low you are. Um, the other thing that's kind of been um, top of mind for me recently, I guess, uh, is, you know, if your workloads fundamentally change, that's another uh, reason why you might rethink your architecture. And I think, you know, uh, I was talked with Thomas about this a little bit, and I don't know if you've seen um, some of the discourse recently about Grok that just, you're, well, I don't know if it's new, but they came out with this like language processing unit. Basically, there's a, a number of different architectures focused on uh, inference for models, which is kind mm -hmm. of like this interesting combination of like highly parallel problems but also a sequential nature of you know processing tokens uh in order where you have dependencies between them um right. and that's it's kind of like a uh uh driving some of these new architects which i think is interesting and i think in some of those they are pushing more onto the compiler but you have to you know take into context there that the compiler might be compiling once for a model that runs for a very you know, extended period of time as opposed to like, you know, compiling a, a new build every every 30 minutes or whatever. Um, so right. it seems like, you know, there's 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 lots it's, of different vectors. It's still that dynamism. Consider. It's that the, the, like the, the dynamism of what the user is going to do in the case of like user based mm -hmm. models or whatever. Uh, and the fact that the compiler can't guess, right? The, the, the you know, like a branch. So taking the branch prediction side of things here, you know, like there was all this uh, brouhaha about like, well, maybe we can flag the branches as likely taken, likely not taken, or you could have all this right. kind of like branch prediction hinting in, in there. It's like, well, yeah, but it'll never know that this branch, this loop is always taken 64 times and um, until it isn't. <laughs> and then it's taken 128 right. times. And then, you know, it, or, you know, um, even, you know, I, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm known for C++, but um you know, folks like to compare languages and Java has its both proponents and detractors. And the last thing I ever want to do is fan flames between the two because there's some amazing right. things that Java can do because Java takes this, the sort of like this predictive thing into software. And so you can, and as does, you know, like JavaScript in browsers and anything that has like a modern JIT these days can kind mm -hmm. of go, I can notice regime changes in line and kind of like oh yeah well you know this happens until this thing stops happening and then we can adapt and the program can re-optimize around that and you know people in the c++ community may say oh but we have profile guided optimization we can run our system we can profile it and we feed it back to the compiler and the compiler can make smart things i'm like yeah right can you give me two binaries so that halfway through the day when we get to <laughs> midday and everything's like now instead of it being am it's pm and whatever and that branch is now the other way around or whatever it's been the whole way through can you flip the binary at that point they're like oh no and you're like no you're still relying on the processor doing this right the processor can do it you know you've all seen the the stack overflow post about the branch predictor with you know like sorting the things means that you know the thing goes faster than not sorted it's because like whatever condition you've got is 100 percent predictable until it gets to halfway through the sorted array and then it's exactly wrong twice and then it's 100 percent right for the rest of the time you know that you can't get that behavior if you've got a static compiler because the data is dynamic and so right. maybe i'm still very skeptical about this maybe for certain domains it makes sense maybe you know the kind of things you've described these you know i think transformers or whatever the the, the, the these ai type processes that compile a very different kind of program maybe there's a lot more statistical knowledge that you can have and you can say well this is the inputs. They're going to look this way. We don't care that there's going to be that one dreadful input that if you feed it in, it'll give you, it'll be dreadful, dreadful performance, um, which is, so back to your sort of determinism thing, that's actually an interesting aspect in like in the world. At least one of the, the finance issues that we have is, you know, like these, these markets are huge and you can come up with these amazingly optimized algorithms, which are like for the common case, it's super fast, but then in the, there is like a terrible case. You know, it's like, you know, for example, mm -hmm. if you use a, a, an array to store, uh, the the list of 
orders the things that want to be bought or sold because they are in a strict priority and it's useful to steal from the front and take from the back or whatever um then you a common trick is to actually store it backwards because most of the action happens at the front of the book i.e the end now and now you can pop and push from the back of an array everything else stays where it is hooray you know like this is clever right um but then some joker does something at the back of the book which is now the front of the book and now you've got to shuffle the whole thing down one and you're like well that's unfortunate um and so you've got this and in in our case when you're dealing with this fire hose of information that's coming over this broadcast um if you can't keep up with the network data coming in you drop packets and then you've lost information then you have to go through a very expensive recovery process which means essentially you you can't do anything for like tens of milliseconds hundreds of milliseconds it's a very Mm. expensive very expensive operation um, <laughs> to do and so you have to think about your tail latency and so suddenly the predictability is a sort of an important thing and so these clever algorithms that concentrate on like well, the, the fast case is really 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 fast but there's a terrible worst case is mm-hmm. now bad for you and so a lot of the, the wisdom um, for these kinds of things gets thrown out so for example in one of these data structures I use a linked list and I am unashamed to tell the world that there are occasions when a linked list is the right choice because <laughs> you could, yes cash misses and they can be very expensive but most of the time these things are in 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 the cash right and if they're not in the cash then you've got other problems um and um i can now it's order one right it doesn't matter what i do i can mm-hmm. put things in the front i can take things off the back i can move things out the middle of it it's order one right it's not as fast as like just tacking 64 bits on the end of a, an array of course it isn't but it's consistently okay (laughs) and that's maybe a good enough right and so coming back to that prediction that you said with the compiler Mm. maybe that is fine you know if you don't mind having bad worst cases that are rare with your statistical model of what is going to go through which is essentially what i guess all compilers are doing this at some level they're having to use a heuristic of some description to kind of go i'm guessing this is more likely taken than not so i'm going to lay the code out this way so yeah maybe it's not as bad Maybe I've just taught myself round to to yeah. saying that it's fine for some workloads. <laughs> well, I think I think that's the uh, I, I I think that's you know a description or an illustration of kind of like the problem space. It's understand your domain right and and approach it accordingly. So um, I think that that makes sense. Um, I did want to uh, kind of as the final sort of parts here that we explore in this conversation. Uh, I'm I'm very proud of us getting uh, you know two hours and change in here, and we haven't <laughs> mentioned Compiler Explorer yet, which I'm sure is what the majority of folks who who click on this episode know you for. I suppose so. <laughs> yeah, I would I would love to you know just get a little bit of the um, background. Uh, I, you can also, you know, for folks who haven't uh, uh, used the site before, I explain um, what it is, but also like the uh, the background um, on it and, you know, how you're able to open source it and maybe what it takes to run it today as well. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, in like 2011, 2012-ish, I was uh, at this trading company and they had a very old C++ code base. And I was having an argument with the very conservative, like he uh, head programmer, because I wanted to use this new C plus plus feature called ranged fors, which you know is like what all other languages have for going over a, a container. You know, f- the the equivalent of for i in thing um, in C plus plus it's for auto x colon something, right? Um, and it's should be equivalent to iterating over all of the elements in the thing and obviously the thing is probably say a vector which is to say a variable length array it's just a pointer and a, and a size is what it really is down under the hoods and the pointer to points to the first element and the size is how many elements there are in them and so you know normally you get the size and you start your counter at zero and you re- work for through you know pointer bracket zero pointer brackets one and all that kind of good stuff and the compiler of course rewrites it behind the scenes to be like a pointer that walks along the the memory locations one after another and that's all great and good but it's a pain to write that and it's kind of error prone you can, we've all done things where we've used the wrong size or we've used the wrong kind of iteration or whatever and so c plus plus 11 came along and said we should make it this a language uh, facility but we'd been bitten by this before we were also had some java code and in java if you loop over um and again, not to bash languages, but this is just a side effect of the way that Java works at the time. It may have changed since. Caveat, caveat. Uh, <laughs> in Java, if you had a container and you looped over it using an index, 
that was garbage free, right? You were just making an int on the stack and you were bumping it forward until you got to the end of the size of the container and you were accessing the container and, and provided you weren't doing anything that was generating garbage, you were done, right? Beautiful. But if you did the equivalent of 4x in whatever, I, can, I forget the Java syntax right now, behind the scenes, it created an iterator object that was then the thing that held the where I am in this object and you called next on it. And that's what was happening. So it was syntactic sugar for rewriting it that way. And at the time, there, were, there was a trading system that was written predominantly in Java and they would train themselves into like writing garbage-free Java, which is about as horrible as it sounds. It's like takes all the benefits of a really useful and easy to write language like Java and throws them away and tries to write C code in Java but without any of the benefits of like memory checkers and things because no one's expecting you to do this kind of thing. Anyway, that's that's a whole other rant. So right. um so understandably we were they were a bit reluctant to just with gay abandon start changing the way we wrote our C++ code because it was very performant and they wanted to keep it that way. So I got stroppy um which is british for angry uh got upset about it all and then i um said well okay come here and i got jordan to sit next to me i said right let me show you and so we were experimenting backwards and forwards with like snippets of code where i was turning this flag on and and compiling it one way or the other and eventually being the unix heads that we were i um i wrote like the, the command line of like run gcc on a file output to dash as in stood out um, pipe it through c++ filth which then un- demangles all the symbols pipe it through some said to get rid of some of the nonsense that was that the, the assembler outputs and then i ran that in a watch which means it runs it every mm. second and just displays the output and then in the tmux session i halved and on the other side i ed- opened up the editor to the file that the other side was you can see where this is going um right. <laughs> the other com- the side was was editing so i had the editor on one side and i had the results of the compiler at once a second on the right hand side and then we went back and forth between the various things we tried different compiled settings and we you know we, we kind of fiddled around and, and i was able to show him that actually it was one instruction cheaper to do it the other way for boring reasons that we don't have to get into and so anyway he was like fine with it and now around the same time that, that i was that we were doing this um Joe, the person who had dragged me across the uh, from from Google and dragged me to finance, and then ultimately he joined me in Chicago. Um, he he was one of those polymath folks who knows how to do a bit of everything, and um, he um, he had been dabbling in Node JS apps, and so he was like forever knocking up Node apps and showing you know like little database cruddy things. And um, we'd done some uh, previously. At, at, uh, he showed me how to do them at Google or whatever. And anyway. And so I, in the back of my head, I'm like, hey, I know how to wait web apps, you know, crap little web apps, but web apps nonetheless. I think I can take what I just did and put it in a little web app. And yeah, Compiler Explorer or GCC Explorer, as it was called then, was born. And it was, you know, a few hundred lines of code running in our, on a machine that I had set up in uh, the, the trading company at that time. And it proved very useful you know it doesn't take long to pull then a couple of off-the-shelf widgets for editors and then you know you put a little bit of filtering in and a node app that runs a couple of hundred lines runs the compiler and then just pukes out the output and filters it in some way um and you know it sat for a couple of months and then i thought this is kind of useful actually and so at the time we were been um experimenting with more and more open source stuff the company was still very dodgy about like putting its name to anything Mm -hmm. um, but they said okay you can open source this it's not like competitive advantage or anything like that um but you know you just can't put our name anywhere near it you know because they were worried about legal comeback or something like that anyway their loss um (laughs) because because you know um in 2012 uh i stood up an amazon server running the same code base having open sourced it and um yeah gcc explorer was was born it has it had a couple of compilers and it was like four or five thousand lines of javascript and um very simple docker based security and i put again air, air quotes around that and there it sat for years uh and no one really used it that i knew of um it was convenient we still used it internally um it mm-hmm. was dead handy for like trying out stuff so you know it, it grew so that you can change the compiler settings you can change which style compiler you're using and then as you're typing for sh- given how much bad rap C++ gets for like slow compiles, for very small snippets, the compilers are blazing fast. It's just these giant monstrosities we tend to feed it. So if you're just looking at like a, a small loop or a couple of functions that call each other, it takes milliseconds to to build. And so we can build 
and parse and send back to the the website on the right hand side the sort of annotated syntax highlighted uh, output of the compiler and it becomes a sort of interactive almost like a REPL like you can mm-hmm. start tweaking going like what if I do I++ or plus plus I which of these is faster and you see that it makes no difference whatsoever and that's kind of it leads this sort of journey of discovery and immediacy that makes you kind of like really get a deeper understanding of what you're doing um, but you know fast forward 12 years and it now is 60,000 lines of TypeScript. It is three and a half thousand different compilers, which is about three and a half terabytes of compiler. <laughs> um, it is um, running on somewhere between, anywhere between eight and 15 AWS instances at any one time, varying different types. We've got some that have GPUs in them. We have some that are running Windows. We have uh, the majority of them are running Linux. At some point, we'll stand up some ARM ones so we can do ARM compilers as well. And we have become a we. Um, I'm not just a plural person. I'm. I, we actually, I've got a, a small team now. It's open source. And we've got like five or six people who are like, uh, who have the keys to my Amazon account and can um, administrate the site. And it's become kind of the de facto C++ paste bin stroke mm-hmm. experimental thing so by default it shows the assembly output and so i I like to think that my contribution is putting assembly in front of people who would never have otherwise seen it talking about those 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 flaws of and and abstraction layers it's like it really puts it right in the face of people and go like hey this is what really happens this is what your compiler does you may not think of it doing this but then obviously folks use it just as a general compilation tool and we now support that we can actually execute the code which is security wise terrifying yeah. Um, that you've you've you know, random you know what what is your website? It's essentially a giant remote code execution service, you know. Right. <laughs> and uh, yeah, right. How are you securing it? I don't know. Some amateur people have looked at it and said it looks fine. Uh, <laughs> um, but you know, we it's 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 become a, a rel- pretty significant second job. Um, it's a lot of fun when it's fun. It's a lot of toil when it's not. <laughs> Um, again, I'm very, very lucky and blessed to have the number of uh, contributors that I have. And as again, they can help out on the admin side as well. You know, it takes a lot of care and feeding to keep a website up, especially one that has, you know, daily builds of all the major compilers. We have our own CI infrastructure. We have our own load balancing stuff. We have our own. It's it's huge now. <laughs> um, yeah, and I don't tend to use it as much as I used to because I, my job has changed and for a long while I was writing <laughs> Python all day and it's like, what am I doing with myself? <laughs> right. <laughs> but I'm glad to say I'm starting to use it again. I'm back writing C++ in my day job again. So, Awesome. Um, but yeah, most folks know know me from that is the, the short answer. Um, and I think, you know, you've been very kind by calling it Compiler Explorer, which is what I call it, but I hosted it on my my personal domain and so most people didn't know that that was my name they just thought it was a cool name which which it is i'm very blessed and lucky to have the name that i was given right um <laughs> but a lot of folks um yeah didn't realize and then um they were surprised when i turn up and i said well, yeah and they're like hey wait like the website i'm like uh i guess <laughs> yeah maybe <laughs> yeah i've i've definitely uh uh had had plenty of uh, interactions with folks where where they've said to uh, to just god bolt it. So um. yeah, right. That's, it's it's I know I I did so I have got you know you can get to it at compilerexplorer dot com as well because that's my sort of hedge for the future if I ever need to get my domain name back or whatever. Um, right. But um, yeah, I have now. I took advice from a friend who said, look, took me to one side and said, don't keep you know you can call it that, right? You know, this is like Google never calling it googling something they call it web searching or whatever because it kind of sort of devalues it and to, to get in on the you know the joke as it were is, is not 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 wise but right. um i was you know i was poised to completely just go to the compiler explorer name get rid of the 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 vanity domain name away um and they said this is a gift horse don't don't look it in the mouth right you know this is yeah. <laughs> people think of it as a verb now or a noun and so you should accept that and i'm like I, I, so i begrudgingly do now and in fact my linkedin profile i think says you know programmer and sometime verb or something right. like that so you know i've kind of i've kind of accepted it now and come to peace with it absolutely absolutely well uh last thing i wanted to to chat about here was uh you also have a, a podcast that uh, i think it's <laughs> been a couple couple years now um, it is yes yeah, somehow yeah. we've reached two years now yeah yeah so, so so what was the decision to uh to start two's compliment and uh what's it kind of about so i you know i think many of us during the lockdown went a little bit silly 
um <laughs> you know you heard maybe if, if you're extremely good at editing so listener if you're good if if you don't understand what i'm saying here you know that, that dan has uh, uh been an excellent editor but my dog has been barking in the background um and i apologize for that but the, the, my dog is also a pandemic silliness he's lovely but he was got in the pandemic i learned how to bake bread and i started a podcast these are all the things that i think most people did i think you, you're late to the party actually in this in this regard right. but maybe you started planning right. so i i st- i had it bubbling away in me to to start something as i felt i had something to say and then I kind of bottled it a little bit. I thought, well, I'm, you know, maybe, maybe not. And then I confided in my, my friend at work, Ben, that I was thinking of doing. And he said, you know what? I was thinking this too. And so we're like, oh, what if, what if we, what did, would you do it together? And so <laughs> Two's Compliment was born. And, you know, he, he and I have worked together at a number of companies along the way, but we never worked directly with each other until more recently. So we've been very well aware of each other and we've, we we both like giving presentations and so we've seen each other's presentations at the companies we've worked at to, before but um we hadn't you know directly worked with each other and in fact we haven't really worked that much directly together even though we're like in a small company together now but we have very compatible views and then our little mm-hmm. st- the backstory goes right so i in 1996 went off to go into the games industry and Ben's a little younger. A few years later on, Ben was planning to go into the games industry and then but a sort of sliding doors accident of fate where um, something to do with his wife's job or whatever at the time, he suddenly had to rescind his offer or it was rescinded and he had to go and get a real job, right? And so what we've got is like two people, I never really planned to be in the games industry but fell into it through, you know, aforementioned IRC uh, accident. Um, And he meant to go in the games industry but due to some other exogenous event did not and then we've kind of followed parallel tracks and then Mm -hmm. we found how reasonably compatible our views are and then we've gotten together and we keep discussing things that are interesting to us which is to say two people who've been doing this for 20 and change years um ben is very much into testing and uh, i'm into obviously the c plus plus and performancey type stuff but it's fun to play those things off because they're not exclusive they're very compatible uh, uh, right. and there's a whole host of things that we do a certain way and you know having um grown up in the sort of similar circumstances we've got yeah some interesting things that certainly when we talk to people they're kind of interested in it it seems so you know we just open up a uh, we open up a web browser we start talking at each other and then a half hour episode comes out <laughs> every right. every uh, month once a month we're trying to you know not it's low effort ours is low effort yours is beautiful and well prepared and you're <laughs> researched and everything and in fairness when we have a guest on which is rare we we try to be too but most of the time it's just hey let's talk about uh make makes right. my favorite program off you go <laughs> yep <laughs> Well, I, I will say that uh, uh, I am definitely a big fan of it. So um, I, I appreciate you all you all putting it together, whatever you decide to talk about. And, you know, there's been a uh, uh, a number of kind of podcasts that um, I've taken like little bits and pieces of inspiration from in terms of um, putting putting this show together. So um, I definitely count that one on the list. So um, well, thank I appreciate you. the the time that y'all do invest into it. No, it's, I mean, one of the things that, I, mean, I don't know to what extent you've discovered this so far yourself is that podcasts are very unidirectional. Right. Where, you know, you get a few tweets and then you hear these kind of anecdotes where people say, oh, I listen to your podcast, but it, it's like, you don't get the feedback. It's more like radio in that way. You know, you could imagine like, at one stage, my sister was dating some radio DJ and like you're sat in a room talking to yourself <laughs> right, for like right. four hours a day and you don't really know if anyone's listening to you or not or whether they like it or not. Right. And it feels like that. And especially it's so federated. You don't know how many people are listening, really. You've got all these things that kind of guess, but they're guesses. And so it's lovely to hear that feedback. And, you know, I'm, I'm glad to say that we've we've there have even been some folks that uh, we've hired now at our company. It's a, it's a very long and protracted hiring mechanism to get people interested yeah. <laughs> in your podcast and then go, maybe I should work with them. And then they turn up. And on the similar note, actually, Compiler Explorer, I've now hired two people who have been contributors to Compiler Explorer's very oh, wow. long and, and complicated interview process that it is. Right, but it right. turns out if you can fit a large JavaScript program in your head and make meaningful contributions in a, across a variety of languages and you're a kind person who can hang out on our Discord and be nice to people, you're probably a good person to work with in the day job too. Absolutely. Well, I can definitely uh, speak to that. Coming out of college, my 
uh, first uh, post-college job, I guess, I started working on the open source component of this company um, uh, while I was in college. And they basically just were like, you're doing a lot of work for no money. Would you like to do the same amount of work for some money? And I uh, astutely realized that was a good deal. So uh, That is a good uh, deal, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it was, it was kind of the, – the interview process after that is kind of funny because, you know, you – you have like a fairly large body of work of literally like collaborating on something. So um, it is kind of funny how open source can, can be a conduit for that. Right. Right. For certain. I mean, yeah, absolutely. Interviews cool. are so difficult. So yeah, anything you can do to stick out is right. worthwhile doing. Right. But you know, not everyone has the spare time or will or energy after their day job to do like open source work if they can't do it as well. So, you know, one has to, one has to be careful. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely that's a whole absolutely. other topic and i'm just realizing we don't really want to open any more cans right now yeah. <laughs> that's for uh the episode we're recording next week together okay but, uh, <laughs> no but in, in all seriousness i i uh, i would love to have you back again in the future um i definitely appreciate uh you spending uh nearly two and a half hours with me and, and talking through a, a lot of different things um i definitely had a a, a great time and uh learned a bit and uh i hope our, our listeners will as well well, thank you so much for having me. This is it's a great podcast. I've enjoyed the two episodes that I've been able to listen to so far, and I'm really looking forward to, to hearing the rest of them. I only hope this one stands up and that we've not bored to tears the poor listener <laughs> by this point two and a half hours in. <laughs> I, I, I'm sure folks will love it. But uh, thanks again, Matt, and uh, hope you have a great rest of your week. Thank you. You too.